nektek emlékezem, ha meghallgatjátok jó hunyadi Jánosról. Nagy Jámborságáról, hív szolgálatjáról, erős viadaljáról, Most pedig tisztelettel és And now I would like to ask Professor Dr. Miklós Kásler to deliver the welcome speech of the International Scientific Conference titled The Hunyadi and the Corbin Families. Distinguished uh, Director General, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome all of you and I would like to welcome our distinguished foreign guests, researchers, scholars. If somebody tries to decide uh, the continuity of um, the state, the history, and the idea over the Hungarian history and the 1,100 years, then we have to look at the beginning, the sacral 
dynasty, which represents sovereignty, autonomy, and respect of uh, the ancestors and the common interests. This is the Hungarian tradition, the contract that our ancestors concluded by their blood. Uh, the organization of Christianity from uh, Estergom instead of Salzburg or uh, the Byzantine um, state means that we established a Frank state, a identity and autonomy. The Hungarian Empire from the outset, from the very beginning, had its own uh, mindset and it organized itself according to this mindset. With uh, St. Stephen, we established a realm, an empire that understands what's happening on the earth and beyond. And there is an apostolic king who is the ruler, which will never happen again in the world history. And there is a very slow development of the sacred crown ideology, which uh, gathers uh, all the peoples living here. And from this, a nation will evolve. In my approach, we can take a look at the period from the beginning until the death of Matthias Sunyadi as uh, a single process, which is organized by the principles that I have just talked about. Though the royal power in Hungary is centralized, the autonomy is the guiding principle. And if we go a bit further away, uh, we talk about the Saxon autonomy, the autonomy of uh, the royal towns. We talk about the autonomy of the counties. So all these autonomies come from the sacred crown ideology. So if I express myself very well. We are talking about an ancient democracy, democracy in uh, quotation marks. Everything, power, wealth, estate, the country went back to the sacred crown. And everybody, even the king, only practiced uh, this power, the rights deriving from the sacred crown and these rights were intact well temporarily they could have suspended for external or internal reasons but the king and later the nation had to restore these rights against external powers and also against uh, the internal components. And this is the world where the house of the Arpad uh, ruled. But after the house of Arpad uh, was terminated, a dynasty appears, appeared in the Hungarian history. And we can still see the light of the Hunyadi dynasty. The Hunyadi dynasty had everything that made the House of Arpad great. So they guided the principles of sovereignty, integrity, autonomy, and supporting the autonomy and uh, belief. Hungary, in geographical terms, uh, is located uh, along the route, the migration route of peoples uh, and the last waves were also occurring here and there were some armed migration as well from the Mongols, from the Tatars. And well, actually not 
too many is taught about this at school. And the expansion was continued by the Turks, by the Ottoman power. And this is the period when uh, the successful Hungarian resistance was established for 130 years. A genius, a commander of army, appears with excellent organizational skills. Of course, in the spirit of uh, this historical period, uh, uh, selfless for the sake of the country and uh, to support the country and the interest of the country, he used his own wealth and uh, talent and he offered his life. He was followed by his son who continued and um, made this historical period a perfect one. And in political terms, in military terms, and also in cultural terms, made uh, one of the strongest powers uh, of Europe. So Hungary became one of the strongest powers. Uh, so as a comet, this dynasty appeared, and then they disappeared from among us. I do not wish to refer back to the three generation that was uh, described by Thomas Mann, the rising and the glory and the decline, because this is not what we are talking about in the case of the Hunyadis. They established uh, something that we must remember. They established something that is stable and durable. A lot of very important moments of um, Hungarian history was distorted or was not spoken about. And this is why the Hungarian government established uh, the program, uh, which deals with very essential questions, essential from the perspective of our identity. And <coughs> the aim of the project is uh, to scientifically and professionally examine these perspectives. And this is how the Institute for Hungarian Research was established. Uh, and uh, this is an interdisciplinary attitude and approach that is represented by the Institute. And this is a new perspective by all means. And this is the appearance of a new scientific ethic. I feel that the question of Hunyadis is very topical. You know, man has um, the tendency and willingness and eagerness to understand the thinking of uh, previous generations and to find links between the past and the present. And I think if we do this, we find very, very interesting links between our past and the present. Well, on the agenda are questions such as uh, United Europe uh, or the nation states. In the period of the Hunyadis, Hungary had uh, the king and noblemen and aristocrats, but irrespective of uh, gender, religion and nation, everybody worked together for the country. The word patria was first used in this uh, period of the Hunyadis, patriotism. So when Matthias was elected a king on the frozen Danube, then uh, Mihai Siladi delivered a speech in which he gave four reasons why Matthias should be king. And he says the following. The kings that we borrow in Hungary didn't deliver on the promises. Ladies and gentlemen, of course there is a temptation to go into detail on this idea. And I can do that because I'm not a historian by profession, so I have the right to make mistakes. But this is different in your case, because you represent uh, science and you are uh, erudite uh, professional uh, scholars uh, with high professional ethics. My responsibility and my opportunity here now is to Thank you, 
on behalf of the Hungarian government and on behalf of the Hungarian nation uh, for your work, for your enthusiasm, for your participation here. And I would also like to congratulate on uh, the subject matter that uh, has brought you here. And I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Professor uh, Miklos Kaslan, Minister, for your opening words on history. Right now, I would like to ask our first presenter, Mr. Goksal Bas, uh, uh, the excellent research assistant of the Social Sciences University of Ankara, to deliver his presentation on uh, the Hungarian Ottoman frontier organizations in the late 15th century. It's a comparative presentation. So would you please uh, come to the mic and start your presentation? Thank you. So sorry about this. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> good morning. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to uh, thank the Institute of Hungarian Research for organizing this beautiful event and having me here. And today, I am going to talk about uh, brief Hungarian Ottoman frontier organizations in the late 15th century, and I will make uh, I would like, like to make a small comparison about it. So, when the Ottomans first came to Balkans, and Hungarians you know, were facing with a powerful enemy, and they have to deal with a new danger. So, what Hungarians did in the uh, 15th century is simply before the main Ottoman attacks on Serbia and Bosnia, the medieval Hungarian kingdom managed to build up a new defense system in the southern part of the country by building out buffer states, or we can say that the ring of vassals like Serbia, Bosnia, Wallachia, and Moldavia. And also, although this system was not distinctly well developed, it was sufficient enough for the defense of the kingdom and will soon be effectively improved by the Matias Corvinus. And also, uh, Hungarians organized the Milita Portalis in the late uh, 14th century, and they also employed professional mercenaries and the peasant soldiers like Hussars, Voynux, and Soldatenbayor or Nasados into the southern defense system. And the construction of two, <coughs> a double line of fortresses began from the reign of, uh, in, in the reign of uh, Sigismund to up to Matthias Corvinus. But the fall of the former buffer states in the second half of the 15th century it created greater danger for the inner lands of the Kingdom of Hungary. And with the conquest of Serbia, Bosnia, uh, Ottoman domination of Wallachia and Moldavia, now, for the first time, the Ottomans and the Hungarians began to share a permanent territorial zone. By sharing the same border, both Hungarians and Ottomans implemented a policy <coughs> of protecting the border zones, and also especially after rapid and intense clashes, which resulted in the Ottomans mainly dominating the Western Balkans. And also this era can be defined as a peacetime for 60 years. And the 60 years of peacetime was firstly a result of a kind of stimulate 
between the Ottomans and the Hungarians. And secondly, shifts in foreign policies of two adversaries in different directions. For instance, after the unsuccessful confrontation against Ottomans, Matthias turned all his attention to Southwest Balkans and the Central Europe. And the war for the lands of the Bohemian Crown, also we can also give the example of war of Austria. And the Ottomans too had already gone war with the Venice for the domination of the Aegean Sea and Albania in the late uh, 15th century, uh, in the late <coughs> 60s. As you can see the, here, the Ottoman, Ottoman domination in the Western Balkans and the de facto border zone between the Ottomans and the Hungarians, especially in the Slovene, Slavonia and the, the Pozsika regions. And it was in this era of relative peacetime that Matthias Corvinus managed to reorganize the southern defense system. His main goal was to unify the southern regions from the Adriatic coast to eastern Carpathians under the command of three military officials. As first step, the unification of the offices of the Ban of Croatia, Dalmatia, and Slavonia was completed. This is also called the Panus Croatia et Slavonia. Thus, he was able to subordinate the commanders of the frontier castles and also the mobile troops of the area under the unified control of the Kroatia Slavonian Ban from the sea to the lower Danube. And meanwhile, in a similar manner in the Croatian Slavonian territories, he organized the region of the lower Danube into a unified border system. The result was the emergence of the position of Captain General of the lower parts, which was controlled by the High Sheriffs of the County Tamesh. And from then on, the Captain Generals of the region region stationed the soldiers in the, at the frontier and uh, castles and behind the fortresses, they also disposed their Banderia forces and who were responsible for hindering the Ottoman raiding parties into the inner lands and alongside their military services, the captain generals were also responsible for civil administration of that area. And lastly, the third defense office was led by the Voivod of Transylvania. And after the reforms of Matthias Corvinus, the network of fortresses first organized by King Sigismund seemed to be fixed into a coherent system. The southern part, the southern part of the defense system consists of two parallel lines of border fortresses. The first line, you can see the red line. And this line stretched from the fortress, fortress of Sereni via Orshova and St. Laszlo, Nandorfe Hervas, Simoni, Sabac, Srebrenik, Yaitza, and Kirin Aptos Cordona and Kilisa. And on the other hand, the second line behind the first defense line stretched from Lugos, Karanshevesh, and Temeshvar via Petervarat, the minor castles of the Sremsak, and Dubija, Krupa, Pihac, Tuzeng on the Dalmatian coast. And most of these fortresses on the defensive line were in the loyal hands and aside from a few located in Croatia, the salaries of the guards of castles were paid by the central treasury. And also these castles were protected by several thousand Hungarian and Slavic garrison troops. As for cavalry units, the Hungarian deployed in the frontier zones light mounted soldiers, which consisted of hussars and voinuks. And the force of flotilla, we can say Nasados, also played an important role, and especially in the region of Sabac and Belgrade. These boatmen, who were the Slavic origin mostly, like the hussars and voinuks, had many tasks to hinder the advances of Ottoman Donibian fellows and also <clears throat> to transport Hungarian troops on their plunder raids into the Ottoman territories and hamper the passing attempts of the Ottoman raiding troops into the Hungarian mainland. And for this era, 
We have no archival sources on the number of garrison troops. And, but based on some sources from the late period, it can be estimated that there were approximately 8,000 garrisons and other types of troops along the southern defense line. And also, their annual upkeep costs were between 100 or 130 florins, which equals in that time the 30 percent of the annual income of the whole Hungarian kingdom in uh, 1470s. And for a just just for an example, it was the upkeep costs were like uh, 57 percent of the total Hungarian central treasury in the year 1511. After the successful reforms of Matthias Corvinus, the Ottomans too organized, reorganized their uh, defense line. How they did it? First, they formed, a three, <coughs> they formed three new administrative military units, or we can say Sanjaks, in Hungarian borders. The first one was the Semedrevo, the other one the Hersek, and the other one, the last one, the Zvornik. Also, Ottomans, under the reign of Mehmed II, deployed more fortress guards with different branches into the, these fortresses. For instance, uh, Azeban. Azeban, was, Azeban units were, were simply similar to Nasado's units, which Matthias Corvinus de deployed in the other side of the border. And Ottomans also deployed Farisan, simply mounted soldiers, also were very similar to Hussars in that era. Also, this is also important that Ottomans integrated the old Christian military establishments into the Ottoman military organization like Vlachs, Voynux, and also Martolosus. But after the death of Mehmed II, the, some of the raids of Hungarians, especially led by Palkinisi in the Morava region, destroyed all the Ottoman inner lands. And the letter of Mihail Ali Alibey, the famous uh, <coughs> front lord, frontier lord in that time, Sanjak Bey of Semedrovo, urging to take immediate action against the Hungarian raids which devastated the countryside of Branichovo up to Khrushchevac, two days. And he simply urged that it is necessary to build a new fortresses for the order of this Sanjak one in Coolidge and one of the opposite side of Haram and the last one in the mouth of Peck River across Pojajena. And after that, the first military campaign of Bayezid II, the new Ottoman Sultan, were towards the Peck River and he, with his order, three new fortresses were built on the mouth of on alongside of the Ottoman, alongside <coughs> of the Hungarian frontier. And also, as I mentioned before, Ottomans integrated some of the old Christian military establishment into the main Ottoman organization. First of all, <coughs> the Vlachs, for instance. You can see here the special laws on the Vlachs in Ottoman Rumelia, for instance, this, this Vlachlav in the left, uh, dated from 1477, it simply says that every five houses give one Voynuk and serve the Sanjak Bay for one month. And also the Vlachlov uh, in 1484 from Bosnia simply says that during the campaigns, they give one warrior for 10 houses, even serves with his weapon and armor. And also we have Voynuks in Serbia, and all of them were participating in the military organization of the Ottomans in that region. The Voynuks of Semedrevo, under the command of Sanjak Bey, they are known as Voynuks of Lumnice, written during the time of Ali Bey, Mihail Olu, and they only serve Sanjak Bey. And you can see here the density of the Vlach and Voynuk populations.
in the Ottoman Sanjax, the, especially the Morava basin were the center of the Vlach and Voyne organizations and they were participating in the Ottoman campaigns alongside with the Sanjak base of these five Ottoman Sanjaks. And I have been doing some research on the Ottoman uh, military organization in the front, uh, Hungarian frontier and I found that in total we have 11 1,176 soldiers deployed in the Hungarian frontier to defend the Ottoman zones against the Hungarians. As you can see here, uh, the majority of these troops were the garrison guards and also we have lots of Christian military uh, troops like, you know, Vlachs and also the Voynuks. And this is the map simply shows the situation in the year 1490 when Matthias Corvinus died. And thus the Ottoman chain of fortresses in the Western Balkans are formed as follows in the 1490s. Within and its four surrendering fortresses in the Sanjak were formed the eastern bank of the Ottoman border defense system against the Hungarian kingdom. And the center and the key line of the fortress system was protected by 15 fortresses in the Sanjaks of Semedrovo and Zvornik. And Smedrovo, Ram, Kulic, and Golubac formed the first line of defense along the Danube River to Widen. Avala, Sokograd, Uzice, Maglic, Ostrovija, and Resava set up the second and inner line of this defense system in that Sanjak. And the western side of this chain continued to be lined up with five castles in Zvornik region. And also the eastern bank of the chain, which was Bosnia, stretched from Teočak and ended at the Adriatic coast. And the first line of this defense section was protected by the fortresses, those garrison troops were painting cash. And this military and financial change began during the reign of Mehmed II to build up a new frontier organization against the Hungarian adversary. And, but it was during the reign of Bayezid II that the Ottoman border defense system was re-established and <coughs> in an organized and a coherent way. So, thanks to reforms of Matthias Corvinus, the Hungarians managed to keep Ottomans away for 60 or 70 years. Also, it is important that Ottomans too organized their defense system like the Hungarians and even sometimes they copied the system of the Hungarians. Ottomans and the Hungarians used the same type of troops, a similar type of troops like Hussars, Voynuks and all kind of uh, South Slavic military organization unit. And we can say that for the late 15th century and the early 16th century, we can find too many parallel developments in the border. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Göksel Bass. And yes, we are not disappointed now because um, he is really the expert uh, of uh, the uh, medi medieval uh, frontier organization. We would like to congratulate him on the publication of his article on this. So he very, in a very detailed uh, way, described the frontier organization and how the <coughs> Ottoman Empire 
gradually occupy these uh, territories and what uh, troops, what units uh, were deployed by the Ottomans and the Hungarians uh, alongside the border. So thank you very much for your presentation and we look forward to uh, having the opportunity to read this in the volume. The next speaker is uh, Edmund Malay from the Institute of History from the Academy of Albanian Studies in Tirana. He's going to talk about anti-Osman war and the relations between um, Kastrioti, Skanderbeg and uh, John Hunyadi. Thank you very much for uh, having uh, accepted our invitation. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to talk about the relationship between uh, Skanderbeg and uh, John Hunyadi during the anti-Osman war. Well, as for uh, George Kastrioti Skanderbeg and the relations uh, with Hunyadi, we can say that uh, first he was uh, in relation with John Hunyadi and then his uh, son. Um, uh, according to the assumptions, these relations were established uh, in uh, 1444, uh, and they ended in 1468 when Skanderbeg died. There are three major uh, momentums uh, in this relationship, and these events are related to the anti-Osman wars. We are talking about the 1444, the 1448, and the 1464 as the major years of these events. First, I would like to talk about the relationship between Skanderbeg and uh, John Hunyadi, and this is the central topic of my presentation. Well, Skanderbeg and uh, Hunyadi most uh, probably met um, in 1440 at the beginning of uh, the 1440s uh, when um, Meshit Pasha occupied uh, Sibiu where uh, um, he was also present but Hunyadi was very successful in uh, countering these incursions. A uh, lot of authors write about this event. A Catholic uh, priest, uh, Segoni, who was uh, the archbishop in uh, Albania. Actually, Segoni was the first uh, historiographer, biographer of Skander Bag, and uh, he was uh, writing about this event uh, 10 years after this. Uh, but he doesn't go into detail on this first encounter. In secret, Skander Bag was uh, very active in order to put an end to the Ottoman um, occupation and he wanted to take the power in his hands and not surprisingly he had secret relationship with the Hunyadis and other Christian uh, powerful families but we do not have precise documentation on this and then in 1442 Beck fled the Yalomite battlefield where uh, Hunyadi attacked uh, and won over the Ottomans in September. Stefano Magno is uh, the chronicler who talks about uh, this event, and Piero Venier uh, from Venice is also referred to. In 1443, uh, there was the Battle of Nish. Skanderbeg was uh, one of the uh, four officers uh, here and in this battle of uh, Nish he deserted and he went he fled to Dibra in Albania this was on the 3rd of November in 1443 and uh, Skander Beck with this uh, act also contributed to the victory of uh, John Hunyadi 
Well, as for this uh, battle in uh, literature, there is a letter which uh, Ladislaus, King Ladislaus wrote in 1443 in Buddha, asking Skanderbeg uh, to participate and help him. And he also congratulated Skanderbeg on returning home, and he also congratulated him on occupying the territories and castles. And the letter goes on with a proposal asking Skanderbeg to participate in this in the next battle. But we have to mention that uh, Kander Beg returned home only after the Battle of Nish uh, at the end of November, and this letter of the king was dated 5 July, so it was written uh, more than four months before the events. So this is a fictitious letter. At the same time, uh, it uh, got into the archive of Radonic. Radonic, in this letter, uh, refers to the biography of Skander Beg from a copy that was published in um, um, 1743. Skander Beg fled with his troops. On the 27th of uh, November in 1444, uh, he occupied a fortress and then later on he openly um, to power of the Castriot um, estates. So in the Battle of Nish in 1443, where the Ottoman powers were defeated, uh, was the result of a well uh, thought out plan. They say that Skanderbeg knew uh, the plans of Brankovic and uh, Hunyadi, and that's why his maneuvers were very precise and also very fast. Well, nevertheless, some uh, historians uh, have some reservations concerning the participation of Skanderbeg. Uh, for example, Christoph Frascheri doubts that Skanderbeg participated in the Battle of Nish because uh, Skanderbeg in this uh, uh, time was in Dibra as the governor of this uh, territory. As for the relationship between Skanderbeg and Hungary, we have to go back to 1443 when uh, Ladislas I uh, was preparing for the Balkan campaign and there was a very intensive diplomatic um, activity in this they engaged the Albanian princes and they state that Skanderbeg was aware of the events and he contributed to the events but despite this uh, his name is uh, not mentioned anywhere As for the Balkan campaign, the second wave was in 1444, but it was unsuccessful because uh, the Serbian uh, George Brankovic uh, prevented the Christian uh, army and also prevented the army of uh, Skanderbeg from passing by destroying the passages. And uh, the result was that the Christian uh, army was defeated at Varna on the 10th of November, and the Hungarian king also died. He fell off his horse. And uh, a Janissary, uh, Hamza, saw this and immediately cut uh, the head off. And the head of the king was put on the lancer, and he showed the lancer to the Christian soldiers, which absolutely demoralized uh, the army, and it resulted in a panic and a flee. Hunyadi, with the remaining part of the army, uh, fled through Wallachia to Hungary. And the uh, Vladislav the Postumus 
took uh, the throne, he was actually uh, the son of um, Elizabeth of uh, Luxembourg, but he was a minor. And uh, this is why John Hunyadi was uh, the uh, governor and co-regent. Uh, Hunyadi, uh, in 1448 in uh, Kosovo, on the Amselfeld, they wanted to establish a common front. Uh, Hunyadi had uh, a troop of uh, 24,000. Uh, including Hungarians, Romanians, and uh, Germans, and he was planning to meet Skanderbeg. Both of them wanted uh, to attack the army of uh, Sultan Murat II. On the basis of the letter of Pascual de Zorgo, the army of Hunyadi consisted of uh, 72,000 uh, soldiers. Near Kovini, uh, Hunyadi crossed the Danube uh, and arrived uh, in uh, Krushevac and in the valley of Toplice. He went to Zitnice near Pristina, where the first uh, Battle of Amselfeld was uh, fought. This route over the valleys um, couldn't have been very demanding, very challenging for the army of uh, Hunyadi. And um, it could have supported uh, Hunyadi in Belgrade. Um, well, Hunyadi arrived uh, at Amselfeld in the middle of September, uh, set up uh, uh, the camp, and was and was waiting for uh, Skanderbeg. Uh, he also participated um, in a mass uh, in a church uh, where he thanked God for the victories. But Brankovic um, didn't let uh, the army of Skanderbeg pass again. So this was the second time when it actually happened. I need to mention here that um, the reasons which motivated Brankovic were the following. Well, he had family relations with the Ottoman house because uh, Brankovic was the father-in-law of uh, Murat II. Murat married the daughter of uh, Brankovic, Mara, uh, who is also mentioned as Yerina. And this might have been one of the reasons why Brankovic didn't let Skanderbeg and his uh, army pass. On the other hand, the, there was rivalry uh, between him and uh, the Hunyadis due to some estates in the south part of Hungary, which uh, Hunyadi uh, took from him when Brankovic uh, became the vassal of the Sultan. And also, uh, Brankovic informed the Sultan about the plans of the Hungarian army. And um, this information was uh, uh, received from a nobleman from Ragusa, De Sorgo, who also served Brankovic, but he stayed in the Hungarian camp at this time. Skanderbeg decided um, to make way for himself, but uh, it went very slowly, and he had great difficulties in advancing because the ways were blocked and were destroyed. Uh, so shortly after this, uh, Skanderbeg received information about uh, the defeat of uh, the Christian army near Amselfeld. Well, uh, the delay was also due uh, to uh, the, 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 the battles that Skanderbeg uh, was fighting against the Ottomans. About uh, two kilometers uh, from uh, the Amstelfeld battlefield, Skanderbeg met uh, the remains of uh, Hunyadi. And in this, uh, in October, um, the brother-in-law of Hunyadi also fell victim and died. And uh, the, the army fled over the 
territories of Dracula, Voivod, and uh, he had to flee over uh, the estates uh, of a nobleman, and he was caught in a Serbian uh, village. Uh, and uh, Brankovic actually uh, captured Hunyadi, but for 100,000 uh, Dukat, uh, he let him free. So, as long as uh, the total amount uh, was not received, uh, a hostage had to be left instead of uh, Hunyadi, but Hunyadi was uh, let go. And this all happened uh, at Christmas time in 1448. Uh, Josef von Hammer Burgstar, the Austrian Orientalist, wrote the following about this uh, battle in Kosovo at Ams Amselfeld. He said, the Kosovo battle or the Amselfeld battle wouldn't have been lost by Hunyadi if Skanderbeg had helped him. Murat II uh, didn't uh, make use of uh, this uh, victory because uh, he was very busy um, fighting uh, Skanderbeg and Skanderbeg had to pay 6,000 ducats. After the battle in Amselfeld, the access, the relationship between Skanderbeg and John Hunyadi was uh, weaker, but the communication between the two uh, were continued. So the Senate in Ragusa, in a letter in uh, 1450, uh, the Ragusans uh, inform the Hunyadis that Skanderbeg uh, defended uh, Kruja. And uh, actually, this relationship uh, was terminated after the death of uh, Hunyadi. And Ladislaus, uh, the fifth suddenly died in Prague, and then the Hungarian throne was taken by Matthias, and he continued the policies of his father. In the autumn of 1458, the young Hungarian king, Matthias, followed in the footsteps of his father, and he defeated the Ottomans at the border of the empire. As for the relationship between Matthias and Skanderbeg, that uh, continued because uh, uh, Pope Calixtus, in March 1458, asked the king to go on uh, building what his father built, but he also referred to uh, the cooperation with Skanderbeg. And the Senate in Ragusa sent an envoy to Skanderbeg. However, this envoy was stabbed to death uh, on the way to Albania on the boat. King Matthias tried to um, harmonize or cooperate with Skanderbeg as for the attacks against the Ottomans, but these attempts were unsuccessful. And um, I can talk about, for example, Pope Pius the second, who also um, thought that a very important part in the campaign, military campaign, uh, could be fulfilled by Skanderbeg, but um, it ended up as a failure. And we know um, about this uh, from different sources, and the Pope very suddenly died in Ancona. That was one of the reasons for the failure, but also the Western policies of the young Hungarian king was uh, another reason. And this was the third attempt of Skanderbeg uh, to come to an 
agreement with the Hunyadis and um, launch an attack against the Ottomans. When Matthias, after the failure in Bosnia, turned to uh, the Western world and focused on Frederick III, uh, the pressure was uh, eased on the Ottomans. Uh, the road to the Adriatic Sea was free, and uh, this is how Skanderbeg paid for the dreams of the Hunyadis concerning Western Europe. We would need more time to talk in detail about the relationship between Matthias and Skanderbeg, but it would go beyond this paper. And this is why I'm talking about it in the printed version of my um, paper. The event in uh, 1464 terminated the friendship between uh, the House of the Castriotti and the Hunyadis, but also it put an end uh, to the military cooperation between the two houses against the Ottomans. Uh, Skanderbeg died on the 17th of January in 1468, which again uh, had a major impact on the Ottoman uh, wars. After the death of Skanderbeg, this relationship got weaker and uh, weaker, and they completely uh, came to an end uh, after the Turks occupied Albania. Milan von Suflai says the following, when Albania in 1479 was occupied by the Turks, uh, that had uh, echoes, very strong echoes in Hungary. Uh, in Brasov, there are two um, letters uh, which was uh, addressed uh, to the city council and uh, to uh, Berger. In this, uh, the voivod, uh, from Valak talks about uh, the defeat of uh, uh, Kroja Drivast and Skutaris. The occupation of Albania by the Turks put an end to all the relationships between the two nations. Well, as for the two heroes, the names of these two heroes are very well known and respected, both in Hungary and uh, in Albania. In Tirana, there is a street named after John Hunyadi. And in 2018, negotiations were started about uh, the erection of uh, a Skanderbeg monument in Budapest. Uh, the plan was to put this monument uh, next to the statue of John Hunyadi, and this plan was realized in this month. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Professor, for your presentation, your excellent presentation in which you highlighted uh, uh, the three generation relationships between Hungary and Albania uh, uh, with special emphasis on the military maneuvers uh, uh, in the three eras. You also uh, highlighted new research areas. Thank you very much for that. Uh, you also shared some novelties with us uh, and uh, a special uh, gratitude for presenting uh, the relationship between Matthias and uh, Skanderbeg in a very correct and fair way. And let me also mention that there is uh, that, this, uh, that we are also very proud uh, of the fact that we have the sculpture of Skanderbeg here in uh, Budapest. Uh, right now, as we have uh, uh, heard it from the opening uh, speech of Mr. Minister, uh, you could hear that uh, we do not follow preconceptions when we continue our research. Uh, our next presenter 
is uh, a research fellow of our institute, uh, uh, Eva Teisler. Uh, we speak about uh, the origin of uh, the Hunyadi family based on written sources. She is an excellent uh, representative uh, of the era. Thank you. I would like to welcome the audience uh, with respect. As you have heard, the title of my presentation is What do we know about the origin of the Hanyadi family on the basis of written sources? Contemporaries were also very much interested in their origin. Perhaps we would think that it was due to the personality of King Matthias. No, it is not uh, the truth. Uh, uh, the first person who attracted uh, the attention was uh, John Hunyadi. Uh, with his successful and victorious uh, campaigns. Uh, so contemporaries were very much interested in the family. Already in the 1440s, uh, uh, especially Italy was uh, especially uh, um, producing a rich uh, uh, pool of uh, uh, sources. Italy was uh, somehow also involved in uh, the war against the Ottomans. Uh, as we have uh, we have heard from the previous uh, presentation, uh, Alexius uh, III, the Pope, uh, called the victorious hero of the world, uh, John Hehunyadi, was also thought to be from Italian origin. Uh, the public heard that King Matthias uh, uh, was that uh, King Matthias was the descendant of the Della Scala family in Verona, or uh, <coughs> the son of. Uh, Erge, but Elizabeth, the widow of uh, Louis the First, Hungarian king. Uh, of course, uh, these were just legends, theories, uh, unfounded ones. Uh, many nations uh, were on the belief that the Hunyadi family, and especially King Matthias, were the descendants of uh, families in their own nation. I wanted to highlight or emphasize uh, the Italian legends because this was uh, the country where the first scientific uh, uh, um, studies uh, were prepared on the origin of the Hunyadi family. If we do not want uh, to limit uh, our focus uh, 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 in Italy, we can say that the humanists were the originator of the theories uh, on the origin of the Hunyadi family. Uh, Ransanus, uh, Bishop of Lucera, was the first one who started to write a biography on uh, Matthias Hunyadi. Uh, uh, due to the ideology of humanists, uh, he worked on the basis of analogies, starting or stemming from uh, uh, the fact that they used uh, the coat of arms uh, where uh, Raven was depicted. He uh, was on the belief that uh, Valerius was there, uh, Castor, uh, because he was the he could. Uh, win a, a battle with the help of a raven. Uh, it was strongly linked to uh, the uh, stories heard uh, from Hungarians who stated that the first uh, settlement where the family resided was the island of Covinus. Um, the name of uh, this insula, of this island, uh, um, 
also referred uh, to the origin of the Honyodi family, the ravens. Uh, so thus, uh, he was on the belief that uh, during the time of Flaccus, uh, Covinus was established by the Valerius clan. Uh, 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 it, the uh, general public uh, pronounced the name of the island as uh, 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 Vlachia, uh, Galeotto Matteo, we know it from Galeotto Matteo, uh, uh, that uh, King Matthias didn't pay too much attention to these uh, uh, explanations, and we also know that he never used uh, uh, the name Corvinus. Uh, uh, despite the fact that his contemporaries, uh, for example, Bartholomeus Fonteos uh, or Galeotto Marzio or Ludovicus Carbo in their works dedicated to King Matthias uh, always refer to him as Matthias Corvinus. Uh, out of the uh, humanists in a later age, uh, Enea Silvius Piccolimini and uh, who was later who was who later became a pope uh, uh, adopted the explanation uh, in relation with flaccus from the former ideas but he, he never uh, accepted the flaccus explanation antonio bonfini later uh, partly adopted and partly also modified this theory uh, Antonio Bonfini um, arrived uh, in the Hungarian court uh, 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 carrying his book, uh, uh, The Short History uh, on the Corvin, Corvinus family. The title of this book in Latin was Bravis de Corvine Domus Origine Libellus. Uh, he tried to correct uh, 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 the previous ideas. Arriving in Hungary, he added further information. Uh, <coughs> uh, he found uh, several hundreds of names that he could not uh, fill in uh, on the basis of genealogy. He thus uh, collected the archaeological uh, uh, finds. He examined Roman inscriptions uh, uh, connected to Valerius. Uh, uh, he, he wanted to find the pictures of a raven or an eagle. Um, Orabut uh, is again uh, a topic uh, in his case. Uh, uh, so it, for him, it was not a problem to adapt it into the Valerius ideology. Bonfini, otherwise, uh, had a political aim with writing his uh, book. Uh, as I have mentioned, he arrived in the autumn of 86 in Hungary, 1586. The reason of his uh, arrival was uh, that uh, 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 from 1484, they had been planning a marriage between uh, Bianca Sforza and John Corvin, uh, son of Matthias. Uh, there was a double uh, objective uh, behind one to somehow favor the Hungarian royal family, and the second, uh, that Bianca uh, derived from an area where the Corvinus legend was very strong. He wanted to provide for an appropriate background uh, to John Corvin's uh, origin, something that can also be accepted uh, abroad. Uh, um, uh, at the, uh, from the 1480s, uh, we can see that uh, he's uh, uh, acknowledging uh, uh, John, uh, Duke of Lipto as his own son. 
uh, this uh, charter uh, is dated uh, uh, October 21st of 1479. Uh, uh, he is not only acknowledged as his natural son, but also uh, 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 is the beneficiary, is named as the beneficiary of royal grants, uh, partly with ownership, uh, uh, partly due to the death of his uh, uh, heir. He receives uh, uh, ownership uh, uh, and uh, uh, of uh, lands and uh, ownership of castles in Austria. In Hungary, um, it was held that with the northern campaigns of King Matthias uh, aimed uh, at uh, um, breaking or modifying, amending the pact uh, with uh, 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 Frederick the uh, Third. Uh, 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 the relatives uh, of Matthias supported uh, John, Duke of Lipto, also uh, Matthias's mother left uh, uh, the family heritage uh, to John. Uh, uh, Matthias was aware of the fact that it would be not it would not be enough uh, to bestow uh, huge estates uh, upon uh, John. Uh, uh, he also had uh, an objective uh, to uh, find uh, foreign allies for John. Uh, uh, the best way was uh, uh, to somehow organize a good marriage for him. Uh, Matthias also had his own experiences about that. Uh, uh, for 40, 13 years, he was unable to remarry after Kath uh, the death of Catherine de Pogelvrad uh, because uh, the highest or the most noble royal families uh, uh, regarded him him as a parvenu. This was partly the reason why he took on the name, uh, the family name uh, of Corvinus. Uh, uh, we can see uh, that it is only from this period that he uh, 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 started to use uh, the name Corvinus until his uh, death. Although Bonfinis uh, Libellus uh, did not remain, but uh, uh, he uh, wrote another monumental work, The Decades of Hungary, the, of the Hungarian Empire, and uh, he repeated his uh, ideas. This uh, works of his uh, very rapidly uh, circulated uh, first in manuscripts and later in printed form, uh, which led to the fact that in the 18th century it became the source of uh, unfounded uh, theories, uh, uh, Romanian and uh, uh, Polish Hunyadi families, the construction of the origin of these fictitious uh, family rela relatives. Uh, and it also gave rise uh, to certain ideas or debates uh, on uh, Matthias's links uh, with Romania or Poland. Uh, due to Peter Kolchar, we know that in the story of Matthias created by Bonfini and Razanus, there is only one tangible data, a real uh, data, uh, and that is uh, the following. Konhara, Johannes G. Konhara uh, uh, was the name that was used uh, in uh, the Middle Ages, you can see an arrow on uh, uh, the map. Uh, 
uh, that is uh, the settlement Kuvar uh, in Hungary um, uh, uh, on uh, the bank of uh, the river. Uh, Matthias used to uh, serve as a soldier here, and he was named after this uh, position, uh, post of his. Uh, when we translate uh, the Hungarian term into Latin, uh, it uh, becomes Corvinus, and perhaps that was the origin of the legend Corvi or related to Corvinus. Uh, Bonfin. Uh, Bonfin in his rerum Hungaricum decadini uh, 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 also described uh, a completely unfounded story, something he heard in the hung uh, royal court of Hungary. And uh, to provide some background, he uh, stated that he heard it from Ulrich the Chilla, uh, namely that Matthias was the descendant of uh, Sigismund, uh, the Hungarian king. Uh, um, uh, uh, Sigismund, according to Bonfini, had an illegal uh, son uh, 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 from a noble woman, and uh, uh, she would have been uh, Matthias's mother. Uh, the girl uh, later married a noble man. Uh, Bonfini also tried to identify uh, Matthias Hunyadi's mother, but uh, due to lack of information, uh, in contrast uh, with uh, the Hungarian theories, he stated that he was from Greek origin and he was the descendant of uh, the emperor's uh, family. Gaspar Helta in his 17th uh, century chronicle is reported repeats Bonfini's uh, story uh, in a more colorful way and with slight modifications. He tries to validate the story by stating uh, that uh, uh, he that he heard a story from the descendants uh, of uh, Matthias's servants. Uh, according to Herdei, uh, Sigismund uh, had uh, 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 an affair uh, with a noble woman from the clan of Morgina. Uh, the woman later uh, married uh, uh, Voivodin in Wallachia, Voik Buthi. Uh, uh, uh supposes that the vo uh, that the Voik uh, uh, lived in the area of Transylvania, but later after the marriage, they resettled to Wallachia. Let's see now uh, the three theories uh, related to the origin of John Hunyadi's father. Bonafini says that it was the. Uh, Wallachian boot, or perhaps King Sigismund Kaspar Heltei uh, uh, states uh, that uh, the father was King Sigismund uh, and Wojt Buthi was nothing more but uh, a foster father. Based on the charter, uh, further information can be added here. In a charter in uh, 40, dated. Uh, to 1490, when uh, the Hunyadi family receives their uh, family estate, uh, a further figure is mentioned uh, who is linked to a former century. Uh, uh, a person called Serbe. A son of Mike. Um, unfortunately, we do not know anything uh, about him, and the chapter only is, uh, says about Mike uh, that he was a soldier at uh, the Lower Danube, but no further uh, precise uh, or uh, concrete information is mentioned, perhaps about uh, even the campaigns. Uh, 
if uh, we do not follow a genealogical uh, line, but rather we would like to identify the origin of the Hunyadis, the paternal line of the Hunyadis, on a territorial basis, then we can say that John Turozzi, Janos Turozzi, says that somewhere around Valachia, Ransanos and Bonfin, we mention Keve, Kovin, Kovar, the same settlement by different names. And uh, uh, Ransanos uh, uh, supposes that they lived in the area, and Bonfin says that uh, John Hunyadi was born here. Of course, it cannot be justified, but it is completely obvious that uh, they lived there and they served the soldiers in this area. We know it not only from the charter in 1490, but also we know it uh, from the reports of ambassadors in Italy in 1510-1520. Uh, 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 so uh, Bonfini uh, clearly uh, identifies Transylvania uh, uh, the area of the Kingdom of Hungary as the place of origin of the family. Uh, we can also ask the same question about uh, uh, John Hunyadi's mother. Um, here you can see uh, the counties uh, uh, um, of the age uh, end of 14th, beginning of the 15th century. Bonfin is said that uh, the mother was uh, from Greek origin, from the family of the emperor. Uh, uh, we can absolutely conclude that due to the lack of concrete information, we cannot justify Bonfini's opinion. Halta is said that uh, she was uh, a Morgina uh, girl, the daughter of uh, uh, a, tr uh, a Transylvanian nobleman. Uh, he doesn't know the name of the mother. Uh, for a long time, they thought it was Elizabeth. Uh, right now, there are questions about it. Uh, the name Elizabeth was first uh, recorded by Cortesius. Uh, 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 Cortesius' book is a eulogy to uh, uh, Matthias Corvinus, and in the original text, uh, uh, the author does not speak about the mother of John Hunyadis, uh, uh, but the mother of uh, uh, Matthias, uh, uh, who was, of course, we know, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, the Morigina family cannot be really detected based on charters. There are, there are certain documents which trace back this genealogical theory uh, to the middle of the 15th century. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the area could be linked to the environment of Hatsak if they really exact, e existed. There are other uh, uh, suppositions. Um, uh, uh, according to one of uh, them, the mother could have been Anko Baranskai from Hunyat uh, uh, County. Uh, uh, Anko Baranskai is mentioned as of the widow of uh, Vikes Banko. Uh, it is an estate document, and this is uh, the source uh, on the basis of which uh, we can link the family to Hunyat County. And there were other uh, theories uh, according to which uh, 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 that the Sapoya, due to the uh, regular use of the Sapoya uh, court of arms, besides the Hunyadi court of arms, uh, uh, the uh, maternal line could be traced back to the Sapui family uh, with the location of Pozhaga County. And there was a further, a third theory uh, according to which uh, the murder of John Hojani was uh, an unknown Hungarian noble girl. Uh, uh, Claire was the name of uh, 
the sister, and uh, that's a Roman Catholic name. So does they suppose uh, that the woman was also from a Hungarian Roman Catholic family? Uh, uh, if uh, you look at uh, the locations uh, supposed and you compare it with uh, the names on the map, uh, you can come to the same conclusion as in the case of John Hunyadi's father. Uh, no matter which version uh, can be justified or which version is true, it is for sure that the area is limited to the area of the Kingdom of Hungary. The real question is whether we can uh, somehow link these uh, theories with nationalities or nations. Uh, the uh, answer is a clear no. Uh, although historiography uh, rejected uh, the theory uh, of uh, Sigismund, uh, King Sigismund being uh, the father of John Hunyadi, uh, perhaps archaeogenetics can prove otherwise, uh, but for the time being, uh, uh, this is an unfounded theory that even if uh, the opposite turns out, uh, then we will face another big problem. But perhaps uh, the, our colleagues from the Archaeological Institute will be able to provide an answer to that. After the total invasion in the Transylvanian areas uh, and in the southern parts, uh, there was a very significant uh, 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 Romanian and Slavonic population emerging. They partly arrived, they were partly settled in the area. This is the reason why we can find numerous settlements under the name of Vlach. But what does Vlach mean? In the 14th, 15th century, north of the Tissa River, River Ruthenians uh, settled uh, uh, in the, uh, the northern parts of in the northern bank of uh, the Tissa. Were also called Vlachs. Uh, from the 15th century, uh, uh, century we have a charter which uh, states Vlach means shepherd. Uh, uh, so they give a definition, so which means that thus were usually peoples who that we uh, who were shepherd uh, 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 peoples. Uh, uh, in addition to that, Vlach is also used as a, a common denominator of Slavonian peoples. Uh, so the reply, the answer, the response is that we unfortunately cannot identify a nationality and whether archaeogenetics can uh, uh, come to more precise and reliable uh, uh, conclusions. Uh, that is something my colleague will talk, talk about. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to Eva Teisler for this outstanding and excellent uh, lecture. It was not only excellent, but also very nice because she has shown some very nice pictures. And I think you all understand that it's good to share all this knowledge. Um, Eva gathered the information together. And um, maybe in the medieval era, these uh, information or these reasons were politically motivated, but uh, still it um, included information and data uh, that is uh, very closely related to Transylvania, the functioning and operation of Transylvania, and also to the activities of the Hunyatis, as we heard during this day. And uh, also uh, tomorrow, we will also hear lectures papers on uh, archaeogenetics, uh, which might as well bring us closer to the origin of the Hunyadi family. I, I forgot also to tell you at the beginning that uh, we would also like to welcome everybody, all those at least 100 people who are watching us over the Facebook. So we are not 
only numerous here, but we also have viewers on the internet. Uh, so on uh, the, the day on this uh, 565th anniversary of the victory in uh, uh, Belgrade, I would like to have a coffee break now and then we continue. So now a coffee break. Thank you.
Tisztelt Hölgyeim! Megy. Ja, jó. Tisztelt Hölgyeim és Uraim! Kérem, hogy fáradjunk be. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please come in to the Roman Hall? We would like to continue the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please join us here in the Roman Hall? Thank you. A levezető az nem én vagyok, csak én jövök. Elvileg. De akkor itt ki is van vetítve. Az jó, hogy itt ki van
Hölgyeim és Uraim, tisztelt vendégeink, tisztelt konferencia. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, we continue the conference. We are starting now the second section. My name is uh, Vizi Tamás László. I'm the deputy uh, director general of the Institute for the Hungarian Research, and I will be moderating uh, the coming part of the session. So we will pick up on where our colleague Eva Teisler left off. She was talking about the origin of the Hunyadis. Um, she was talking uh, about uh, her examinations of the sources which are related to the origins of the uh, Hunyadis. And Endre Neparatsky, Director Neparatsky, our next speaker, was sitting next to me. And um, Endre Neparatsky is uh, the director of the Research Center for Archaeogenetics of the Institute. And uh, while Eva was talking, we were whispering to one another, saying that, well, on the basis of the sources, we do not really know where to put, where to place uh, the origins of the Hunyari. So the sources are not informative. But fortunately, now, in the 21st uh, century, um, there is such a plethora of information and plethora of data and knowledge in uh, natural sciences, uh, and they also have uh, tools and instruments that makes it possible for them uh, to make uh, conclusions in a much more uh, accurate way in genetics. A very significant role is uh, played in this by Professor Dr. Kaschler, who was um, actually the person who supported this research, archaeogenetic research, from the very beginning. And uh, he provided the circumstances and the necessary uh, requirements, uh, which makes it possible for us to have uh, the most up-to-date uh, uh, technology. And uh, this team is led by our friend, colleague, Andre Neparatsky. Oh, I'm telling you very honestly that I'm, I'm really, I'm really envious of Andra because what he's doing is a novelty, and uh, actually what he's doing is related to things that have been considered as taboos for centuries or for decades, and he can justify or he can refute these uh, decades or centuries old. Uh, uh, conclusions. Um, and I was envious of him when he, uh, this year in January in Croatia, in Lepoglava, was able uh, to work in the Lepoglava church. And I would like to extend our gratitude to our Croatian colleagues here. So we were able to open uh, the tomb in Lepoglava and uh, Miklos Makoldi and Andre Neparatsky had the opportunity to examine the remains. Uh, and this is how we were able to open the ossuary uh, in Székesfehérvár this year. These examinations, uh, these research also serve the purpose to identify uh, the genetic uh, or genealogy of the Corvin family. And uh, we would like to see new results, new findings that uh, are not included in the sources of the then contemporaries. So now I would like to call on uh, Mr. Andre Neporatsky, the director of the Research Center for Archaeogenetics, uh, to talk about uh, the interdisciplinary research on the Corvin family. The floor is yours, Mr. Neporatsky. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation and also for this um, opportunity. I would like to thank Vizi uh, Tomás László, Deputy General Director, for this chance. Uh, well, actually, I have some experience of delivering papers, but this is really a very impressive location here on the Heroes Square in the Museum of Fine Arts. So I would like to say thanks to everybody who has been working in the background to make it possible for as many people as possible to follow uh, the uh, papers uh, on the internet in Hungarian, in foreign languages. I think that uh, this is not 
uh, routine thing. And uh, I think that this is absolutely unique in Hungary to organize conferences that uh, are not closing its doors, but to the contrary, tries to reach out as many people as possible. And I can tell you that my friends and my, my acquaintances uh, are following us uh, in the United States, in China and in Mongolia as well. And they are following what we are talking about and uh, they are following this conference on this family of uh, the Hungarians and of the people in the Carpathian Basin. No matter um, how much some uh, 20th century historians have been trying to divide uh, the nations and the people in the Carpathian Basin along the stories of such uh, Hamilis, but uh, I would like to also thank for the cooperation of our Croatian colleagues here, because um, there are researchers who are proud of their history and do not see such a family as a dividing line. But we are all are proud of the fact that there was such a family and uh, we would like to have the Hunyadis and the Corvins. Uh, we all want to have them. So what is this interdisciplinary research that we are carrying out? at our institute. I think it is sensational that uh, genetic research is also, um, is also assisted by other uh, fields of science to help one another and also to learn about a part of our past within the given framework, trying to get as close as possible to reality. And I think that in the Institute of uh, Hungarian Research, this research into the Corvin family also wants to contribute to reality and to our way coming closer to reality. Of course, this research, as every research, has its own goals, objectives. Uh, we formulated a plan of research we forward it to the partners in the research. And um, as we mentioned, we went to Croatia, uh, to Lepoglava uh, with uh, my colleague uh, Miklos Makoldi. We opened uh, the tomb of uh, Janos and uh, Krzysztof uh, Korvin. And uh, this year, we are going to analyze the remains. These are outstanding figures, and uh, for this reason, we have worked out and applied a technique uh, which is called the minimally invasive uh, technique. We need to sample the bones. Uh, uh, we are going to examine the cranial base. I will talk about this. So that was one of the minimum requirements of um, committing ourselves to this research because these are prominent figures and uh, we would like to safeguard these remains for the next generations because we have nothing else but these remains, these, the, these bones. And we also applied a radiocarbon dating method. We identified uh, the, the date um, of uh, these uh, human remains. Uh, we are fully documenting the research in the Institute for Hungarian Research. And then we put these remains back to the tombs, uh, to the resting place where they were. And uh, after this, uh, this work, we put them back to, together with uh, the, the, the parish. In the second phase, um, we publish the data, the finding of the analysis, and um, we will also have the opportunity to compare the genetic data with the uh, remains uh, in Székesfehérvár. So you can see now these uh, target dates. Now I'm going to tell you what is the state of play 
And uh, actually, I can tell you in advance that we have uh, made uh, more progress than we had planned before. But these are the target dates, the milestones that we accepted. So what do we know about the Hunyadi family? Eva Teisler, a very um, well put together all the data. What I'm talking about is something that we know for sure. Uh, Laszlo Hunyadi and Mátyás Hunyadi had Janos Hunyadi as their father, and the mother was Szilágyi Erzsébet. Uh, Mátyás or Matthias Hunyadi was born in Kolozsvár, Klus, Napoka. Um, he had uh, two wives. Um, no children were born out of these wedlocks. And uh, he had he had um, an extramarital relationship with uh, Borbala Edelplek. And uh, from this uh, relationship, uh, they had uh, a child. Janos Korwin, the wife was uh, Beatrix, uh, friend Japan and they had three children and as you can see uh, unfortunately none of them lived long enough they uh, died very early so this is the genealogical tree as for Janos Korwin we know the resting place he was um, a safe uh, point and uh, Christoph Korwin is uh, buried next to him that we know on the basis of the sources. So we identified these two persons uh, as a point of departure. So if we define their genetic, uh, the, the gen genome, then we will be able to identify the family. So we will be able to identify Matthias Hunyadi, who is uh, uh, resting in Székesfehérvár, and we can also find um, other members of the family, grandfather, for example, and then we can uh, justify or refute the assumptions. But what do we need to be able to do this? First, we need to go to Croatia, to Lepoglava, where you can see that in the picture, you can see that in the picture that uh, my colleague Miklos Makoldi is uh, taking the skull out of the tomb, and uh, to my right, to to, um, to my right in the picture, you can see what 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 was the secondary position in which uh, the uh, colleague found these earthly remains, and we were actually very happy to see that um, the cranial remain was also found in the tomb. So we were able to, uh, to carry out anthropological measurements. Uh, Lutza Kish made the anthropological measurements. To the left, you can see Christoph Korwin, the skull of uh, Christoph Korwin, the remains of the skull of Christoph uh, Korwin. Yes, uh, this is the skull of a very young a uh, boy, and uh, to the right, to my right, is the skull of Janos Korwin, uh, European anthropo classical uh, anthropological measurements were made, and uh, we compared these two data uh, made by Aurel Török. Those data uh, come from the end of the 19th century, so he, he made uh, similar anthropological measures. Actually, we were examining the same samples as Aurel Török was uh, examining. And uh, concerning these uh, skulls, we took some pictures, so we have uh, photographs to document uh, them. We have 3D models to examine uh, to skulls. So later on in the future, uh, the faces will be reconstructed digitally. And um, this digital reconstruction also will be supplemented with genetic and biological reconstruction. As for the color of the eye, the color of the hair, uh, we will need some markers and we will be able to predict 
how Janos Korvin actually looked like, what he actually looked like. And this is the point where the new field of science comes in. This is archaeogenetics. What is archaeogenetics? Uh, actually, we need very special, very specific laboratory conditions. Uh, we extract the DNA sequences and then we subject this uh, to uh, genetic analysis. Uh, if we want to extract the DNA, um, if we want to go to a, a spot to sample, what you can see actually uh, dates back to 2017, and uh, this is a methodology that we introduced, and we have been applying this ever since. There are two advantages that we can do the sampling on the spot, and we take the sample by applying a methodology which will leave no traces on the skull later on. So it means that it's not an invasive or not, or is a minimally invasive methodology. This is a skull before sampling and after sampling. On the left, uh, this is a skull of Janos Korvin from the bottom. Uh, actually, I took a sample from the root of the uh, uh, tooth and the other is the petrous bone. The petrous bone. It's very important to have samples to act as controls. So the two samples will serve as controls. You can compare this. Uh, I circled in red the two spots where um, I took the sample from. So the root or the root of the tooth was taken. This is what we cut off and uh, it leaves no um, trace if we put it back. So if uh, we bear a very tiny hole, then uh, there is no visible trace of it. It was checked on the spot and uh, actually this is the way we did, I did the sampling. Okay, so after the sampling and uh, if the the petrous bone and uh, the tooth are sampled. Now you can see the petrous bone in green from inside the skull. Then the next step comes and this is the DNA extraction. In the course of the DNA extraction, we extract the DNA un under aseptic conditions and this is done in the laboratory, in the research laboratory. What does such a laboratory look like? What, what is a sterile or aseptic laboratory? You can see the floor plan of um, the laboratory. It's very important uh, that uh, we should proceed in one direction only. A, unfortunately, this hazmat uh, looks very familiar to everybody. Some years ago, it was not so widespread, but it is um, a necessity for my colleagues who are here now listening to this uh, paper. So my colleagues uh, use it uh, every day in the sterile aseptic DNA laboratory. This is needed because we as uh, human beings also carry different substances which might uh, contaminate the sample. So the cross-contamination is a risk cross-contamination means that our DNA sequence or um, anybody else's DNA sequence who is around might contaminate the sample. This is why uh, sterile or aseptic laboratory conditions are necessary and the powdered bone is the substance from which we extract the DNA. This is a very specific area of genetics, but um, I think that um, um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, rather technical. We, 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 we have uh, acid, very strongly acid uh, uh, conditions. Uh, then we measure the DNA uh, concentrate of the sam sample. In the case of Janos and uh, Christoph Korvin, we concluded that all the sampling, the DNA extractions uh, were successful because these um, samples contained uh, the DNA. So from this, we went on. We sent the DNA samples to an uh, independent laboratory. 
where an SDR analysis was performed, and we, in our um, state-of-the-art uh, laboratory, um, established new generation uh, sequencing. Uh, and this is important because the two findings confirm one another. So later on in the publications, uh, we can refer to the fact that these uh, findings were uh, cross-confirmed by two laboratories. Uh, as for the bibliography, genetic bibliography, this is something very specific, but the objective is sequencing. Sequencing is actually the process when we um, read or establish the um, serial, the um, the series of uh, of the genetic substance, the genetic material, and refer to them by um, letters. So we are not just reading markers from uh, the DNA sample of a human being. What we can also read all the specific individual markers of Janos and Christoph Corwin. How should you imagine this? It's the the well, actually. Um, the DNA sequence of a human being today contains more than three billion letters, but uh, this is not enough. We need to process this data with different methods. What are these methodologies that we apply? Maybe everybody is aware of the fact that everybody has um, a nucleus uh, in which you find the chromosomes and the genes are in the uh, chromosomes. Uh, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, women have uh, double X chromosomes and um, males have a Y chromosomes. So the DNA sequence, if we read everything, leads to more than 3 billion letters, more than 3 billion. So if we want to see some, uh, some examples, you can see that uh, in the right-hand corner, this is what we are working uh, with. There, are, there is no microphone for the speaker. Uh, could you please tell the speaker to... Or maybe there is no microphone for the interpreter. There is no incoming sound. There is no incoming sound. Could you please tell the speaker to stop uh, for a second because there is no incoming sound in the interpreting booth. Can we tr can we try now? Can Yes, fine. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's coming. It's coming now. Could you please start speaking so that I can check whether now I have incoming sound? Right. Okay. No, it was actually not the slide. It was the sound. It was uh, the the microphone was cut off here, so we didn't have the sound. Yes. Please go on. Thank you very much. So, uh, this is uh, three. So we are examining three different uh, sections uh, in the figure. You can see. Uh, the the eukaryotic uh, cell, you find the mitochondria outside, and uh, the mitochondria have, uh, they own uh, DNA sequence, which is matrilinearly uh, passed on. L earlier, this is what we were examining. And later on, we started to examine the Y chromosome, which is in the nucleus. This is uh, the chromosome. In the case of uh, Janos and Christoph, we don't 
only examine the Y chromosome and the mitochondrion, but we define the DNA sequence of all the 22 uh, pairs. And this is necessary because from the three different sections, we can uh, uh, conclude uh, different things concerning the origins of the individuals. Uh, so this is the family tree. This is a simplified family tree. If uh, on the left you follow the Y chromosome, which is the blue line, then you can see the patrilineal uh, way of uh, passing on the Y chromosome. So the color is the same. Now, if you see the matrilineal uh, passing down of uh, the mitochondrium, then you can see that the mitochondrial DNA is passed down from the mother to the daughter. So if we define the mitochondrial um, genealogy, then we can say if the great, where the great grandfather, the great grandmother, and the great grandparents uh, are from, if we define the Y chromosome of a boy, then we will be able to define all the ancestors' uh, Y chromosomes. Uh, so we can make conclusions uh, concerning uh, the line of the father and here we can cover thousands of years and when we do the mitochondrial examination if we take a look at the great grandmother and the great grandfather then we can say that all the other chromosomes are passed down to 50 50 percent so there is a greater degree of variation and if you take a look at the grandfather and the father, you can see how the chromosomes, the long lines, are passed down uh, from the grandfather to the father. There is a higher degree of variation uh, in this case, uh, and these can provide the answers to completely different questions. Uh, and now, we can see that uh, we, are, we can uh, examine all the sequences of the Corwins. So what did we do in the um, methodology? We defined the sequence of the mitogenomes. Uh, why? Because uh, they have uh, different uh, mothers. So this is why a different mitochondrial sequence had to be defined, and we did so. We defined the, the Y chromosomal markers. This is uh, very important if we talk about uh, a father and a son, because this is uh, roughly completely the same uh, sequence. And as I mentioned, um, in an independent uh, laboratory, the short tandem repeat sequences were uh, defined. Uh, it is very important because if there are, for example, lawsuits uh, concern, concerning uh, the paternal uh, legal issues, then this is the short tandem repeat is the methodology which can provide uh, a answer to the question. If the short tandem repeat section is the same uh, in terms of different markers, then those individuals uh, must be in a father-son relationship and we m make a single nucleotide polymorphism which relates to the individuals. Uh, the individuals have uh, just one letter difference if uh, this sequence. And then we can reconstruct the genealogical tree. What you can see is based on previous research. Uh, if uh, we defined the individu individual's uh, sequences, and we put Janos Korbin and Kristof into this family tree, then we will be able to tell uh, where in the word you find the patrilineal or matrilineal line, which uh, is typical of them. So you can see um, mitochondrial lines in Africa only or out of Africa only. So you can define the geographical regions uh, that these uh, haplotypes, haplogroups uh, come from. And uh, 
we were able or we are able to also identify the routes, the migration routes of the Homo sapiens. And if we have, for example, um, an individual who is in the M haplo group, then we can see if these came from Asia or if we find them in Europe, then we will be able to say that the ancestors of this individual lived uh, first in the Middle East, then in Asia, and now they live in Europe. So we can identify the geographical location where the individual uh, is from. And in addition, we carried out population genomic analysis, which means that we collected more than 1,240,000 million random haplotypical markers. And then we compared these to the living population, currently living population, Eurasian living population, and we compared the markers to the individual markers. And uh, the principle in the, in the framework of the principal component analysis, we put this on a map. Out of the 1,200,000 uh, uh, markers, the algorithm collects uh, those which have the highest degree of variability. This is going to be the first axis, and the second axis will show the points with the highest degree of variation. And if you put the individuals into this, uh, into this matrix of two axes, uh, then we can see that on the map, uh, individuals uh, with uh, markers that show the highest degree of variability are close to one another. So, this is the principal component analysis and the map that I uh, told you about. Here, you can see, well, actually, the, the inscriptions are not very important, but you can see that there is a first and the second principal component. These are dots. The dots are the sequences of individuals. What we do is as follows. The gray background is the Eurasian total population. To the left, you see the European population, all of them. To the right, you can see the Asian uh, population, and you can see a north-south orientation, a north-south uh, axis. In the north, you can see the Finnish or the Norwegian populations, and uh, the, the Middle Eastern population is towards the south. Uh, to the right, you can see Siberians in the north and uh, Vietnamese and other Asian populations are to the south. And in between the two, there is the steppe, uh, the total population, the global population living now, um, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, etc. And uh, those individuals who are revealed in Europe uh, and they are mapped uh, in terms of their genome close to the Asians, those came once from Asia, and they are similar, they have similar features than the Asian population. And we can uh, define the geolocation of uh, the different population groups. And with this methodology, the geneticists can group uh, populations into groups, even remains which uh, are uh, several thousand years old. And this is uh, independent from any hypothesis. So we do not need uh, any hypothesis concerning the ethnicity or anything. So if a Han sample is mapped in Asia, then the ancestors came from Asia, and if uh, there is another sample which is mapped uh, close to the Germans, then this is a sample or this is an individual or group that uh, must have uh, uh, originated uh, from uh, the uh, Germans. Uh, 
so we can make conclusions concerning the ethnicities of the individuals. And there is another analysis, the so-called uh, admixture analysis. Uh, here we have a number of uh, ancient population with K number, and we suppose, we assume that every individual is a mix of these, and we can define the ancient population of that individual, and we can decide uh, to what extent, to what percentage uh, the individual is uh, mixing uh, the genetics of ancient uh, populations. Uh, so this is also independent from any hypothesis, of course. So this provides information on the ratio of uh, different genetic uh, uh, background. And uh, the other one is, the next one is the F3 outgroup analysis, which helps us uh, to find a common or a shared genetic uh, history, a shared uh, genealogy. We can define the closest uh, genetic relationship of individuals. And when we are done with these methodologies, then in an international journal, we will publish the data. But now, what is the state of play? We have progressed. We went to Székesfehérvár in Hungary. And uh, in the former coronation um, basilica, where more than 35 uh, kings and uh, queens were crowned. And in addition to that, this is also a burial place of 15 uh, kings. And uh, you saw uh, the, or you can see uh, what it looks like. But these remains uh, are uh, crowded into one tomb. And this is what it looks like now. This is uh, the main square of Székesfehérvár. Uh, this is at the ground level, actually, and there is an ossuary where in metal boxes uh, the remains uh, uh, lie unidentified. Matthias Hunyadi is one of the rulers whose uh, remains are here. And by defining the DNA of uh, Janos and Christoph uh, Korwin, we could start or launch the forensic analysis. And you can see some photos of the ceremonious uh, launching of the forensic analysis. And this is actually a large-scale research uh, project uh, where we are trying to define the total genome of hundreds of remains. But of course, we are not only interested in the Hunyadi family, but all the rulers, all the rulers uh, and all the families uh, who are buried there. And um, well, thanks to the research team headed by uh, uh, Professor Kaschler and Professor Sant Irmai from uh, the Institute of Oncology. We have uh, data and we have uh, some findings uh, concerning the House of Arpad. We have the genome, the genetic data of the first um, royal um, uh, Hungarian uh, House of, uh, of the rural Rulers. And we have been able to identify uh, this uh, genome with the help of the Archbishop and with the help of uh, the mayor. And we started to analyze the remains in the ossuary. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Director Andre Napraski, for your excellent and uh, interesting presentation. Uh, I have expressed uh, my gratitude uh, also in the... Uh, I would also like to extend my gratitude, or I would also like to thank you on behalf of the 2,000 viewers who watch uh, 
and used uh, uh, watched this uh, conference on the Facebook, and uh, uh, I would uh, like to return to the original thoughts of uh, Director General, Mr. Director General, in his opening speech. Uh, uh, that's for sure that at least there was one positive feature of uh, the COVID pandemic. So, uh, uh, we decided uh, to, to hold online conferences uh, instead of live conferences. And right now, uh, in the present uh, Virus situation, we uh, organize mixed uh, conferences, uh, partly live, partly live, and partly online. So we can see that several thousand people listened uh, to the previous presentation. Uh, uh, 2021, 2023 is uh, the timeline of the research, and I would also, last, also like to thank for the detailed description of the <coughs> excavation of uh, in Leprograda. Uh, I think this was perhaps uh, uh, the first time that uh, uh, we have uh, been able to listen to such a detailed uh, uh, presentation. Of course, we saw the news on television, etc. Uh, I myself uh, I am a historian. I deal with fine arts, uh, and I always thought that I would not be able to grasp the essence of such uh, uh, natural scientific topic, but it was so clear that uh, uh, I was able to follow it, and uh, hopefully I could also understand it. It was nice to see it uh, from the outset until the very end of the process, uh, sample taking, methodology, tools, uh, uh, etc. So all these uh, proce all these processes uh, became somehow tangible for us. So thank you very much indeed again. Of course, uh, during the coffee break, during the lunch break, if you have questions to the present uh, f to the speakers, uh, uh, um, everybody is available. Uh, <coughs> dear uh, conference. Uh, uh, right now, I would like to ask Chiara Maria Carpentieri, uh, who is uh, a teacher at, uh, at the Sacra Cuore um, uh, Catholic, uh, Catholic University in Milan, uh, um, uh, a teacher at the Department of Medieval Humanities and Renaissance. He will speak about the special Hungarian volumes of the Ambrosiana Library of Milan. Uh, I think it is uh, not surprising uh, when I say that the relations between uh, the Kingdom of Hungary and uh, the Italian cities uh, date back to long, long centuries. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this fact uh, has become very important uh, during our conference when we talk about uh, the beginning of the reign of um, King Matthias. Uh, at the beginning of his reign, uh, numerous uh, uh, Italian humanists uh, arrived in his court, or we can think of uh, the renowned lecturers uh, of uh, the uh, University of Prague, or we can think of the very famous uh, library of Matthias and uh, the Corviniana uh, uh, collections, the codices. Uh, so right now, uh, what we are interested in is the treasure hidden uh, in the Ambrosiana library, either imprinted or in many uh, form or in uh, the form of manuscripts. Mm. Madam, the floor is yours. Thank you. I would like to welcome everyone wholeheartedly. First of all, I would like to thank for uh, the opportunity to present my um, <coughs> Uh, study or research in such a beautiful surroundings. Uh, uh, I would like to speak 
about uh, the Hungarica stored in the Ambrosiana uh, library. Uh, during the late Middle Ages and uh, the modern age, uh, the historical and cultural relations were established between uh, Italy and Hungary. Of course, there are previous uh, documents that preserve the memory of these relations, but basically it was during the reign of King Matthias that the number of these documents increased. Uh, Hungarian humanism uh, invited uh, Italian scientists, uh, scholars, and uh, artists. Uh, let me just emphasize a few important moments during uh, the era of humanism. The University of Pozsony being established uh, uh, with famous foreign teachers invited by Matthias uh, then. The renovation and the expansion of the royal palace in Buddha, uh, uh, during which Matthias commissioned Italian workers and architects, uh, carvers and painters. Uh, very many master, very many masters uh, arrived in Buddha. Uh, the other, <coughs> the third uh, connection is uh, the establishment of the famous Bibliotheca Corviniana. Uh, Matthias uh, systematically purchased uh, books uh, from Italy, in Italy. He copied them. Uh, uh, there were copiers also uh, employed in Buda at the laboratory of Vespasiano di Bisticci. At least 30 Italian uh, uh, copy, uh, copiers and carvers uh, work there, Min miniaturists work here. Taddeo uh, Ugoleto, uh, um, the Greek scholar, also worked here. He was responsible for collecting books and expanding the collection. Hungarian students were systematically sent uh, to study at Italian universities, for example, Padua, Bologna, and Ferrara. Uh, for example, uh, Janus Panunius also studied uh, in Ferrara. And I think uh, the Italian-Hungarian relations became uh, more intensive when uh, in 1476, Matthias uh, married Beatrice of Aragon. As a, as a result of which uh, uh, Gallimaco Espiriante, Galeotto Marzio de Narni, and Antonio Bonfini, famous writers and poets, uh, came uh, to Buddha. And naturally, these types of uh, relations were not alone. Diplomatic relations were also forged between uh, Hungary and Italian cities. The first uh, reason for the intensifying diplomatic uh, relations uh, were uh, to somehow halt uh, the Turkish invasion. Uh, here, of course, financial matters also emerged. The other reason was uh, Beatrice of Aragon, the younger daughter of King Ferdinand, uh, 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 who married uh, uh, Matthias, King Matthias, that was also endorsed by Pope Sixtus the Fourth, who at the time supported Naples in their anti-Ottoman fire uh, fight. Uh, of course, everybody was very cautious uh, uh, with their statements. Uh, of course, Hungarian history in the 15th century and the evolution of the Italian-Hungarian relations in the period uh, are uh, uh, also reported in uh, um, uh, a great bulk of sources. Uh, uh, the Vestigia project was uh, launched uh, 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 to increase the corpus 
of her child documentary testimonies uh, that are very numerous uh, in number. The aim of the Vestigia project is to carry out researches in the archives of different Italian cities. Uh, 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 I also participated in the research. I uh, studied the, the library, Ambrosian uh, Library in Milan. Basically, I uh, wanted to find documents in Italian and uh, Latin uh, 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 on, the, on subjects like historiography, history, uh, um, literature, etc., that would uh, prove uh, the relations between Italy and Hungary. Uh, I was able uh, to detect uh, uh, 120 documents, out of which 13 directly uh, uh, deal with Matthias's reign. Um, uh, uh, in the, uh, 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 there is a special uh, foundation in the Ambrosiana Library who lived uh, in the uh, 15th century. He, he was a very famous uh, uh, collector. Uh, uh, he established one of the, perhaps the most uh, uh, famous uh, library in Europe. It was a very rich uh, uh, library. Uh, uh, it contained uh, 750 manuscripts, 9,000 printed volumes, and in addition to that, scientific instruments, uh, art objects, uh, globes, celestial and terrestrial globes, uh, geographical and hydrographic maps, minerals, fossils, etc., coins, medals uh, that he collected from the different parts of Europe, including Hungary. Uh, the library primarily uh, contained literary works. Uh, uh, it, for example, um, um, stored the uh, documents of correspondence with eminent European writers, uh, uh, letters, um, Pirelli exchanged, uh, and texts, official and unofficial texts uh, that. Uh, uh, depict the political topics of the 16th century Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, these um, unofficial or official uh, documents are reports sent to, uh, to Pinelli by his agents and informants who were scattered throughout the territory of the territory of the of Europe. Uh, after uh, Pinelli's uh, death, uh, 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 Federico Borromeo uh, bought uh, the majority of the collection. Uh, the most uh, interesting manuscripts in Latin and Greek, uh, and in the uh, uh, when the Pinelli materials arrived, uh, they were catalogued. B uh, 311 source, that is uh, the catalog name, and all uh, uh, documents uh, uh, were catalogued under this mark. Uh, the original catalog marks uh, remained uh, the original marks uh, of the Pinelli collection, but there is one section uh, which is uh, marked with ZZ. Uh, 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 that is a special uh, catalog number dedicated to materials related to Hungary. Hungary. Uh, it is obvious that as uh, they proceeded, I, as I proceeded with my research, uh, uh, I, I was able to detect uh, formerly unknown documents in the ZZ uh, shelf mark. Uh, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, documents uh, 
on the Polish-Hungarian relationship that is uh, uh, catalogued under the shelf mark H. Uh, in addition to that, there are very many papers uh, and documents that do not contain the or original mark of Pirelli, but there are uh, certain uh, uh, documents that were sent to Pinelli from over, uh, all over Europe. These are usually a collection of dispatches and notices. Uh, let's now speak about Domion Gens related to Matthias Corvinus. Uh, 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 these documents usually derive from the Pinelli collection. Uh, there are uh, books, uh, documents on uh, Cor uh, Matthias Corvin. Uh, uh, later we will uh, return to that. And then there are certain instructions and letters uh, <coughs> on uh, what should or what did happen in uh, the country ruled by Matthias. Uh, then there are documents on the war uh, uh, against the Czechs. Uh, um, and there are certain documents uh, uh, that are uh, usually related to the war, but also deal with uh, the personality of uh, the king. For example, there is a prophecy uh, 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 of Antonio Torquato. Uh, in 14 and 80, written down by Torquato, and 14 a, in 1480, uh, he stayed uh, there until uh, 1490. Uh, you can see the mark number. This. Uh, uh, this uh, prophecy, co uh, this uh, volume contained a, 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 a prophecy uh, 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 this uh, volume was collected by the Pirelli Foundation in uh, 1530. Uh, we do not have uh, uh, reliable data. Perhaps there were Italian, uh, there were in Italian scientists who said that uh, perhaps uh, Torquato was uh, uh, not, uh, did not stay in Matthias' uh, court. What is very interesting that uh, this volume contains precise prophecies, the so-called baleful prophecies on the effects of the astral conjunctions uh, in uh, 1504. 1507. Uh, for example, uh, it contained that from the north, uh, so it is an accurate forecast, from 1507, uh, the volume announces an, the advent of a heresiarch from the north who would subvert the church, uh, the sack of Rome, famines, plagues, earthquakes, floods, etc. So uh, we can suppose that perhaps it was a post-eventum, uh, a posterior, uh, subsequent uh, 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 adjustment of the original uh, prophecies. So when the volume was uh, re and reprinted, uh, the prophecies were re and rewritten uh, uh, so that they could follow the actual uh, uh, evolution of the events. Uh, so somehow the text was adjusted uh, uh, a posteriori to the real events. Um, the second uh, and third uh, documents are related to Antonio Bonfini. Uh, everyone knows that Bonfini uh, stayed in Buddha twice. Uh, the first occasion was a short stay, three months, uh, uh, and then uh, from eight to 91, he was uh, the official bibliographer 
of uh, King Matthias. Both documents can be dated to the period of these uh, stays, or at least uh, these documents got to the library uh, uh, because uh, 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 Bonfini uh, had uh, uh, a certain role in it. Filarite di Architectura, although the title is uh, in Latin, but the, uh, the opus is in uh, Italian. Bonfini uh, wrote uh, this book. Uh, uh, Bonfini translated uh, uh, the Italian text into uh, Latin so that uh, Matthias could also read the text. Uh, his aim was to enrich the collection of the architectural works of the uh, Corviniana Libraria. The uh, Redificatore, the Edificatoria and the Architectura, these are fragments uh, uh, of two codices written by Leon Battista Alberti. Uh, 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 the, the original uh, mark is Y30. There is a preface to Matthias uh, in it, uh, that's uh, Liber Primus, or the first book, and then Tabula Totius Libri di Architectura, it, which means that the old books uh, that were on architecture. And the next uh, book I would like to talk about is uh, uh, also Bonfini's book, uh, uh, Exceptum from Rerum Ungaricum Decades, Experts uh, from uh, the Decades of Hungarian Issues. Uh, it's a short uh, book. Uh, 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 this, uh, Matthias uh, ordered these experts. Uh, uh, four decades are covered. They were originally written to Laszlo II. Uh, 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 from 1490-96, it is an additional uh, or a posterior addition to that. Uh, it is a very famous uh, book. Uh, and let me also mention uh, uh, Chronica uh, Hungarorum by Turozzi. Janos Janos Turozzi is also stored in uh, the Ambrosian Library. It is just a footnote here. In the excerptum, in the expert, uh, excerpt, uh, Bonfini lists uh, all the nations and peoples who occur both in Asia and Europe. Uh, starting from the Huns, uh, who uh, he uh, 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 counts as the ancestors of Hungarians. Uh, then uh, 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 there are two other uh, uh, books uh, uh, that are important. One is uh, Strotz's uh, Epitaphium Mattie Corvini, as an epitaph uh, uh, dedicated to Matthias. He was a famous uh, humanist, uh, friend of uh, Janus Panunius. Uh, he uh, uh, highlights two important uh, uh, facts about uh, Matthias that he was born under a fortunate SARS. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, two, he speaks about or writes about the excellent uh, um, capabilities and capacities uh, of Matthias. Uh, 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 he was uh, strong. Uh, uh, he had a, a vivid uh, mentality, and he had logics. Um, uh, the second book I would like to sp speak about is a book uh, dated to 1490, also part of the Pirelli uh, collection. And now let's see the letters uh, uh, that uh, date back to the reign of King uh, Matthias. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, letters uh, that uh, came from the Chancellery, Chancellery of Duke of Milan, Francesco Sforza. The first letter, uh, dated February the 20, uh, 1465, uh, was sent by Agostino Rossi, uh, who was uh, in Rome. Uh, uh, he was from uh, he was he was a Milanese envoy, so he briefs Duke Francesco Sforza on the arrival of a Turkish ambassador at the court court of the King of Naples. Uh, Naples. That was uh, quite unfortunate news. Uh, uh, King Matthias uh, 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 left behind uh, the siege. Uh, um, uh, against uh, the infidels. He even abandoned the bombers on the spot because he heard the rumors uh, about the imminent arrival of the Turks uh, uh, with an arm. Um, the situation was very grave, and uh, Pope Paul II was waiting, uh, waiting a response from the Italian Christian princes. Uh, he requested them to 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 provide help against the fight of the unbelievers in Hungary. He also tried to strengthen Matthias. Uh, uh, he also tried to encourage him uh, uh, to start a defensive war at. Uh, uh, the southern borders of Hungary. Dalmatia, Dalmatia was also involved uh, in this. Uh, at first, they uh, had uh, victories, uh, but then, uh, 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 um, after the death of uh, Pio II, uh, 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 the Italian dukes uh, and uh, Aristocrats uh, stopped uh, sending aid and the money, so there was a serious uh, uh, decline uh, as far as the Italian support is concerned. Uh, then the second one is uh, a letter sent to Agostino uh, Rossi. Uh, 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 it was uh, also bad news. Uh, uh, rumors uh, came from Hungary that the Republic of Venice, which was an ally of uh, King Matthias, was considering to negotiate a truce with the Turks. Uh, 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 the Duke of Milan uh, uh, mentions uh, or foreshadows or forecasts that the Holy See would be quite bitter about uh, uh, such an event. Uh, 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 at the beginning, uh, uh, they thought uh, that uh, Matthias would should resist alone, but unfortunately, he could not do it alone. Then, uh, 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 a letter sent by uh, Sixtus the Fourth, Pope Sixtus the Fourth, sent uh, to uh, uh, the Bishop of Teano. Uh, where he requested uh, uh, that the dispute between Emperor Frederick III and King Matthias should uh, uh, somehow be eased or stopped, uh, because there were frequent fights between the two rulers. When uh, uh, Laszlo, uh, the fifth of Hungary died, uh, Of the fights erupted between the two rulers. Frederick III seized the Hungarian crown. The Pope wanted to intervene. And in 1481, uh, here I would, uh, in Latin, no. Uh, no, um, in, in Latin, nullas rationis, fasionis, nullas partis, nulla mandata, nullas literas, nullos nuncios aut legatus voluere, ad potuesse aficere, uh, ut uh, uh, discordia. Uh, so, no request, no pleas, uh, no party, no instruction, nothing had to stop uh, 
uh, the conflict. So the end result was that the Pope should resolve the dispute. And finally, the last two instructions. Um, Uh, the first one, 82, 14, uh, in 1483, Maraschi, the Bishop of Città di Castello uh, um, informs uh, uh, Sixtus IV uh, on the renewal of conflicts uh, uh, between uh, uh, Hungarians and the uh, Ottomans. Uh, Gennari, Turkish uh, pre prince, uh, uh, the brother of Sultan Bayezid II, started uh, to fight uh, uh, with the King of Hungary, Matthias. Uh, and, uh, but then he was uh, uh, held prisoner by the Knights of Rhodos. Uh, uh, um, in order to help the Pope to, to somehow stop uh, the conflict. But Venice, by all means, wanted to release uh, uh, the prisoner of war, uh, the Turkish priest, Prince Cem, because they thought uh, that the situation would be better used uh, by Venice than by Matthias. Another bishop, uh, uh, of Orte and Civita Castellana, who was called Ang Angelus, uh, uh, wrote a letter uh, to the Pope uh, in 1489, uh, um, Ignatius VIII, uh, about the renewal of the Czech Hungarian fights. Uh, uh, he reviews uh, the events, the military events of uh, the 70s and the 80s. Uh, he, uh, uh, the continuous conflicts with George uh, of Podjebrad and uh, uh, the war uh, with uh, Casimir the Fourth, King of Poland. Uh, um, he speaks. Uh, about uh, the Czech Hussites, uh, who were supported by the King of Bohemia. And the Pope supports King Matthias against uh, the Hussites and uh, the Bohemian King. And then, there are major, uh, there are sources of major historic uh, uh, significance. Uh, Because in the end, he succeeded uh, uh, to be crowned as king of uh, the Czech lands. Uh, the last uh, major uh, uh, work is a document that is not uh, related uh, to King Matthias directly, but it is uh, about Beatrice of Aragon, the second wife of Matthias. That's a rather peculiar. A book. Uh, uh, it describes various tragic and amorous uh, stories that occurred in Naples and elsewhere. This is a collection of stories, uh, also called uh, Crown Manuscripts, uh, Corona Manuscripts. Uh, 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 the alleged authors uh, are pseudo names, uh, Silvio and Ascanio. Uh, these are rather uh, deflammatory uh, uh, writings. These are biographies of, uh, biographies of uh, uh, people in Naples. Uh, uh, and the, there are uh, very vul vulgar uh, uh, parts uh, in the book, uh, uh, which was written in different uh, uh, times. Uh, uh, the collection lasts until the seven, uh, sev 1730s. Uh, 37 biographies uh, are contained in the book, uh, uh, and one of them is the uh, life story of Beatrice of Aragon. Uh, so the work was composed at different times. Uh, what they write about uh, 
Beatrice that she was highly admirable. She was highly intellectual despite her sex and age. And she became an expert in literature. She was magnanimous and liberal, but at the same time, there had never ever been any woman in history who would have been showed so liberal in her amorous affairs as her, although she was a married woman. Uh, when she was young, uh, 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 she uh, was in love uh, with the page of Anne, uh, Don Ramiro Virra Currata, who was beautiful, uh, similar to Marvel, uh, and uh, uh, the future queen uh, 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 simply offered herself uh, as a prey to the page uh, and uh, the co uh, 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 the affair was so ardent uh, that uh, Ramiro was soon found strangled in the vicinity of uh, Beatrice, uh, and the author says that Eleonora, her sister, uh, was no better than Beatrice, although she was uh, more cautious uh, in her love affairs, uh, although she also had a shameful affair feel with uh, Don Diego Cavaniglia. Uh, and then, uh, perhaps, uh, 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 it was less interesting for uh, the authors, the decent part of her life, uh, namely uh, her marriage to Matthias Corvinus is briefly described when she was proposed. Uh, she left for Hungary, accompanied by her brother. Uh, after Matthias' death, she married Ladislaus II, former king of Bohemia, but she was soon uh, repudiated uh, uh, for her indecency. Uh, and the pretense was that she was unable to bear children, so she was uh, uh, sick. Uh, in uh, 1501, she returned to Naples uh, to the ca uh, cast at the castle of Capuene. Uh, and uh, she had a love affair with Consalvo de Carduba, and she lived until the age of 51. Uh, she died from fever. The 12th uh, document is uh, a report on the Kingdom of Hungary at the time of King Matthias in 1463. Uh, there are two copies. Uh, uh, the book does not describe the whole uh, ruling uh, era, all of the beginning of his uh, reign. Uh, here you can see the shelf uh, number. Uh, this document was also studied in Hungary. The 15th century Hungary, uh, it is an in-depth ge geographical, ethnographic, economic, and historical political description of the 15th century Hungary, uh, attributed with many reservations to, uh, to the Venetian Papal Nuncio and the Bishop of Crete, Gerula Molando. Uh, so there are certain reservations. Uh, uh, in the first part, uh, the geography of Hungary is presented, the ethnography is described, uh, um, uh, the borders are described, uh, the structure of society is revealed, the society, con uh, society contains of uh, barons, nobles, citizens, and peasants, uh, and uh, uh, then we some descriptions about uh, geography. Uh, there are very many low-altitude mountains, but at the same time, there is a wonderful plain land uh, where most agriculture or products uh, are produced. Uh, and then they speak about the rich salt mines, uh, gold and silver mines in Transylvania. In the second part, uh, uh, the Hungarian people are described. They are. Uh, powerful, strong, uh, combative, uh, who constantly fight with the Turks. Uh, uh, 
uh, they give the list of the uh, defense uh, fortresses at the borders, and then they write about the river Danube, which is much bigger than the Po River, river in Lombardia. And then uh, uh, the second part is on the history of Hungary from uh, 1380 to 1462. This is exactly the period when uh, Matthias and Frederick III the third agree on the return of the Srikert crown to Hungary, but it is only ratified the next, the following year. But what is most important or interesting is the legend uh, of Matthias. Uh, it is like uh, history, uh, like lit uh, like an epos, uh, epic, uh, an epic description. It speaks about his imprisonment, his liberation. Uh, he was elected by acclamation on the frozen river. Then it is about his clashes with Frederick the uh, Third and with the Bohemian Hussites, uh, and then with uh, the barons and aristocrats in Hungary. Then uh, um, uh, the, the sieges uh, or the battles with the Hussites are described uh, uh, when uh, uh, Matthias uh, tried it to prevent uh, uh, or resist the northern invasion uh, of the Hussites, uh, which ended with a peace pact uh, with Podjevrad, uh, uh, who then uh, uh, forced Matthias uh, to marry his uh, daughter. <laughs> Mm, what is uh, quite interesting uh, that uh, on uh, Folly 9, all those uh, uh, all, uh, things in favor and against Matthias are uh, listed uh, uh, against. Matthias is not uh, very much liked by the Hungarian aristocracy because uh, he is the son of John, who was not a noble Hungarian, but uh, was a Wallachian. Uh, and the barons, uh, the aristocrats of Hungary, uh, do not want to support or s even s or more, uh, or serve a king uh, with such a strange uh, 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 background. Uh, uh, then uh, the the work states that the crown uh, indeed belongs to Frederick the uh, Third. Uh, then they say that the king is alone, without relatives, uh, and when he would like to create new functionaries, he should uh, use the pool of. Uh, people who are not from noble origin, and thus uh, the nobles and the aristocrats of the country uh, do not uh, want to serve these newly appointed officials. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the fourth critical remark is uh, that uh, everything uh, Matthias has done was done uh, with money, so he used uh, 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 almost to the total resources of the uh, of uh, the country. But let's see the pro arguments. Uh, uh, the first, uh, his father John has a very good reputation because he did a lot for the country. Another favorable condition is that he is very young, and despite his young age, he was very successful in fighting the Turks and Frederick uh, and uh, against the Hussites. Uh, and uh, as he was born uh, in uh, Hungary, uh, uh, Hungarians uh, regard him as a Hungarian king. Uh, and uh, Matthias would like to maintain justice, and he ha leads a very honest and pi pious uh, life. Uh, 
the mother. Uh, the mother was, is a holy and wise woman, much adored in Hungary, much respected in Hungary. Then, all the castles and fortresses of the kingdom uh, are possessed uh, by uh, Matthias, uh, and uh, 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 the king would like to uh, uh, promote the career of all his friends, uh, to promote them to high positions. Uh, uh, his uh, friends uh, originally came from uh, very uh, uh, prelates, uh, priests, but then, of course, uh, uh, in a later stage, uh, his friends were also secular aristocrats or lords. Uh, and uh, 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 another um, pro-argument is that uh, he has great wealth, uh, 200,000 ducats uh, per year. Uh, this uh, was the royal income from the salt mines in Transylvania. And then um, a regular uh, and irregular or extraordinary taxes uh, imposed by King Matthias in order to be able to finance the, his wars against the, the Czechs and the uh, uh, Ottomans. Uh, 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 so these were all, all attributes that were uh, regarded as very positive. Uh, 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 th these uh, uh, um, uh, taxes are also described. Uh, the fourth uh, taxes uh, were gold, silver, and copper were processed in money. Then the 30th taxes, uh, it was a custom and general uh, tax. Uh, 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 all the merchants uh, who entered and left uh, the kingdom had to pay 5% levy on all goods imported and exported or just uh, simply uh, transported uh, through the kingdom. Uh, and the end uh, is uh, that uh, Matthias uh, had all these uh, revenues uh, 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 and if he needed some extra resources, he had to uh, 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 discuss it with the aristocracy, aristocracy of the country. Michele Riccio, and that's the uh, another document. Uh, it's a book on the genealogy uh, of European ruling uh, families. Uh, this is an expert or an extract. Uh, uh, the title is, uh, uh, or uh, uh, so the book is on the la great uh, ruling uh, families of Europe, uh, Naples, Sicilia, and one part of the book. This. Uh, uh, with Hungary uh, from 373 uh, AD to Laszlo or Ladislaw II. Uh, there is a short part on King Matthias, his imprisonment, his release, uh, his election as king by acclamation, then uh, his wars uh, and uh, events uh, after his death uh, are also summarized, sum, summarized, summarized, summarized. Uh, of course, his marriage to Beatrice or with Beatrice is also mentioned uh, in this short chapter on his uh, deeds and life. Uh, the first uh, two parts uh, describe uh, 
uh, his deeds uh, in the sixth year of his uh, rule that he was uh, a crown in Sekesfeyrvar, that he expelled the Turks, that he made that pact with the emperor, uh, uh, that he also had internal fights. Uh, the second part uh, uh, is about uh, his uh, fights with uh, Casimir the Fourth, uh, and then a very short uh, reference uh, to. Uh, the second wife, uh, Beatrice of Aragon, uh, 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 and uh, uh, Matthias uh, sent help when the Turks invaded Puya, and uh, that he died in the 37th, in fact, in the 32nd year of his rule. So these are some new new details that might contribute to uh, uh, to painting a more complete, comprehensive picture of the Hungarian-Ottoman relations in the 15th and 16th century. Thank you. I would like to thank very much to Chiara Maria Carpentieri for this uh, excellent paper. And I would like to thank her, especially uh, the short description of uh, the project, uh, which is uh, headed by Professor Domokos. And it's very important. Uh, to reveal those uh, sources in Italian libraries which are rich in Hungarian references. And um, the Ambrosiana, Libraria Ambrosiana, uh, was presented in great detail by Madame Chiara Maria Carpentieri, listing and collecting thematically all the documents that can be found there from uh, fragments, uh, from abstracts and extracts uh, to a broader perspective, a broader context. And very, very interesting events were rendered uh, from the life of Beatrix uh, to me. Uh, the part about uh, 1463 was the most interesting. Uh, Professor Malai was also uh, talked about how the offensive uh, of the military offensive of uh, Matthias stopped after 1464. And uh, actually, she was also uh, talking about uh, the Italian sources which dried up, and that was also one reason why these offenses were terminated. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam, uh, who is um, also an expert on the literary relations between Italy and Hungary. Ladies and gentlemen, the morning session has come to an end. We are a bit behind, so now we are going to have a lunch break of 35, 40 minutes. And I suggest that we come back at 1.20. So we come back at 1.20, and uh, our colleague, Director Pomozy, will chair the session after the lunch. So thank you very much again to all the speakers and uh, thank you for being here. Enjoy your lunch and see you at 1.20. One, at thank you.
Köszönöm. Ladies and gentlemen, the afternoon section of our conference uh, will continue immediately. Please sit down. Hölgyeim és uraim, rögtön megkezdjük a konferenciánk délutáni szekcióját. Kérem, hogy foglalják el helyüket. Remélem, hogy mindenki megebédelt, és kérem szépen, hogy jöjjünk vissza a terem. I hope everybody had lunch. May I ask you to come back, please, to the hall? We would like to continue the conference. Thank you very much. And my colleague, Peter Pomozi, will um, chair this session. Peter.
Ladies and gentlemen, please come back to the conference hall. We will go on in two minutes. Kérem szépen, hogy mindenki jöjjön vissza, aki hallgatja az előadásokat, két percen belül kezdünk. Köszönöm. Automatice, ez a... Jó, köszönöm. Jó, akkor a hölgyeim és uraim... Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear guests from all over the world. Now... Let us start the afternoon session of our conference on the Hunyadis and uh, the Corvins. It's going to be a real, genuine Central European session with Hungarian, Polish uh, participants and uh, issues relating to Italy, Poland and Hungary. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Stanislav Sroka from the Institute of uh, History from the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. He is our first speaker. Mr. Stanislav uh, Stroka has uh, diverse uh, research uh, uh, into late medieval relations, not only between Hungary and Poland, but also Poland and Italy. So I'm sure that this is going to be a versatile uh, paper and extremely relevant uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, our conference. He has a lot of uh, publications, uh, uh, Polish uh, peregrinates in Italy at Italian universities, uh, or, for example, uh, the relation between small Poland and uh, Bardejov. And what he's going to talk about is robberies on the Polish-Hungarian border during the reign of the Matthias Corvinus. So you can see that uh, the uh, Polish-Hungarian two friends who uh, fight together and drink together is not always true. The floor is yours, Professor Sroka. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, conference. Uh, this is uh, going to be a Hungarian presentation titled uh, Robberies on the Polish-Hungarian border during the reign of Matthias Corvinus. So, in medieval times, the Slovak Janosik was the most famous or infamous person amongst the, the highwaymen, highway robberies. However, in the 15th century, there was a chaos uh, in Upper Hungary, which was uh, very beneficial for ordinary, regular uh, robbers. Uh, on the Hungarian-Polish uh, border, highwaymen were very frequent. And uh, the reason is because uh, trade, commerce uh, between uh, Polish and Hungarian cities uh, um, was 
developing fast, so there were a lot of caravans in the mountains, and these were the major targets of the attacks of the robbers. So all the um, caravans or trades men or merchants uh, going to or coming from Bardeyov uh, very rarely safe. But interesting is the uh, fact that it's not only robbers, but high-ranking officials were also robbers. For example, the Komorovsky brothers, Peter, Miklos, uh, the stewards or bailiffs of Orova and Lipto. So there was an anarchy, actually and the rulers provided shelters to these gangs, uh, the gangs of robbers. The source of my paper is a lot of documents in the Bardey of Archives. Most of these documents are re related to requests uh, to gain back uh, the stolen goods. Uh, and these uh, requests describe the conditions the circumstances of the robbery. And these are very rich sources, uh, and we can learn a lot about how trade was done on the border between Poland and Hungary. We would think that um, the friendly relationship between Poland and Hungary meant that um, the situation was very peaceful between the two countries. However, uh, the official diplomatic relations of the ruler, ruling dynasties are different than the situation on the borders. The courts in different cities uh, mostly executed robbers, so they were hanged. However, the hangmen were very demanding and they wanted a high salary for their work. So there was a shortage of hangmen. For example, in April 1463, the judge in Mushina, Jan Wolski, asked uh, the Bardejov court and the judge to send a hangman to uh, carry out the execution, the hanging of the robber. These executions uh, were public, there were wide with broad audiences, and the audience included uh, all the other robbers. But they were not deterred from further robberies. Um, there is a very specific document in the archives in uh, Bardejov without date. Uh, some robbers, a gang, declared a war on the city because four gangmen were hanged and uh, they threatened uh, the city, and they asked for 400 zloty as a ransom, and the 400 zloty had to be deposited in the Mogile Monastery or at the Carthausians in the Red uh, Monastery. You can see on the left side a um, the, 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 the people to be hanged, and the inscription says uh, they were innocent. Um, and there were other decorations or illustrations uh, in this letter. Um, Orova Murain Dunayet, Sanok, Rimanova, Pshemish. These were the cities on the letter, and also weapons, fire, broom. And under uh, the name of the cities was a hole burnt. And actually, these uh, objects uh, that were painted on the letter were uh, the instruments of revenge. And a small broom was hanging instead of the stamp on the letter. The specialist literature has already described or presented this document many times. They try to identify the date uh, of it and the authors, because the robbers called themselves uh, brothers the historians uh, thought that they are Bratchiks, brothers, who were very active robbers in Upper Hungary, especially in the second half of the 15th century. Finally, it was established that this letter of interest dates back to 25 July 1493, and it was written by the gang of Fedor Glovac, out of revenge, because uh, the other gangmen, uh, uh, such as uh, Vashka, the 
brother of Globati was hanged. They operated for about three years. In comparison with other gangs, this is a relatively long time, and um, the judges um, in the cities on the border terminated the activities of the gang. Well, actually, the gang was uh, terminated, and uh, the statements of Stasek from Oslova and Szenek from Krasnobrod revealed the names of the members of the gangs. These people were tortured because torturing was uh, a part and parcel of the court proceedings. Actually, it was in the 12th century uh, that torture became part of the court procedures based on the Roman law, and uh, it started to be applied from the 16th uh, century. After, in 1532, uh, the Diet uh, uh, proclaimed the Constitutio Criminalis Carolina. Most of the survived documents talks about smaller or minor robberies, fightings, and uh, highway robberies. We can provide some illustrations uh, on what acts were performed. For example, in 1452, the robbers took the horse of the judge in Cergova. The horses represented a very, very high value in those times, and uh, there are a lot of remaining descriptions concerning the veterinary medications and diseases of uh, horses. Or they took, for example, wine, which was uh, traded or transported from Hungary to Poland. In 1472, uh, Lukas Vilus, a burger from Krosno had uh, some barrels full of wine stolen, or, for example, four barrels of wine were stolen from Andrzej Igielce. The rubbers, for example, were also interested in copper or iron. In 1457, the burgers of uh, Levce stole the copper from uh, Gerge in Krakow, and uh, Elizabeth, so the Polish queen herself, uh, acted as an intermediary. But we do not know how successful she was. Wool, fish, money, clothes, or fur coats was also very popular with the uh, robbers. Uh, or, for example, they stole livestock, such as pigs. Uh, they also stole things from uh, churches uh, in 1474 in Zmigrod, for example. Or uh, there was a story where um, a Catholic uh, priest had to pay some money for the stolen goods to regain them, because those stolen goods, uh, shellies, for example, appeared in the church of a neighboring city, not because the neighboring city and the, the priest in the neighboring city stole these things, but because uh, the robbers uh, sold these to another church. Uh, well, the robbers were also active in kidnapping, and they asked for a ransom. In May 1456, for example, Eshbeta from Zmigrod wrote a letter to the city of uh, uh, Bartva, uh, asking the city to let two men free who were kidnapped by the robbers. And uh, the Earl from Biet also turned to the city, uh, city council in Bardayov. And some years later, Jan Volsky uh, from uh, Musina, also intermediated with Istvan Zapoya, um, the regent of uh, Upper Hungary, uh, to let his men free. We can also add that the second wife of Zapoya was Piast Jadviga. We do not know whether this intermediation was successful or not. These robbers operating along the borders of Poland and uh, Hungary 
uh, didn't show any mercy to the members of rich, influential families or the royal envoys. In 1479, for example, Kashimir's Jagiellonczyk turned to uh, Bardajove because uh, Jan Ossolinsky was robbed while he was uh, going home from Hungary. These uh, routes were extremely dangerous, so those who were more careful asked for a letter of safe transit for themselves and for uh, their goods. We know many of such documents. There were two uh, castles in Makovice and Brzezovice, which were the most dangerous spots between Bardajov and Shmigrod, because most of the attacks uh, were started from here and, of course, or obviously, uh, the robbers were provided shelter by the ruler of the castle and um, he didn't react to any warnings. So, all in all, the citizens in Makovice sent a letter, a warning letter, and also a letter full of uh, uh, threats in which uh, they were asking for a compensation for the death of, uh, of a burger, of a neighbor. So, we are not talking about lone wolves only, lonely robbers, but uh, gangs which had more than a hundred members. Uh, for example, the most dangerous leaders were Tomas from Tarci and Lipan, Pobude and Ratkovic. As for Pobuda and his activities, he was active around Mushina. And from the letter of Jan Wiepolski, we learn a lot about uh, uh, his uh, deeds. Actually, Jan Wiepolski was an archdeacon, and uh, he was uh, accused of providing a shelter to the robber. It was a very, very serious accusation, and the accusation was raised in 1453 uh, by uh, Kosha, Kos Kosice and Bardejov, and um, the case was sent to the prelate Zbigniew Oleshinsky, but the case uh, wasn't uh, stopped here. And uh, the city council of Bardajov also accused this person uh, for robbery with the starost, but Wiepolski uh, denied the allegations. Tomas from Tarcha and Lipan was also very uh, active uh, in this uh, field. For example, his gang in the autumn of 1453 kidnapped the son of uh, a um, burger. And uh, actually, they, they were asking for a ransom. Thomas and uh, his gang uh, was very dangerous. And uh, at the beginning of the 60s, um, uh, peaceful negotiations were meant to solve the problem. In the mid middle of uh, the 50s, about 80 robbers uh, were located around Biala, which uh, didn't mean anything good for uh, the traveling merchants. So the chaplain, Grzegorz, from the Musina castle, warned in advance the tradesmen. Well, let me tell you something about Pavel Gladish and Maxim. Well, Maxim had his mustache and beard torn out and some other horrific deeds uh, were uh, uh, committed, but the document doesn't talk about these horrors. The gang of Kopika was also active. We know about them from a document dated in 1459. They kidnapped uh, a very well-known burger, Lucas Vilus, and uh, the Schmigrod city councillors and uh, the widow of the chamber holder in Krakow, Katarzyna, also asked uh, them to uh, let this person free. In 1460, another robber, Ratkovich, was talked about a lot. His victims were uh, burghers from uh, uh, Bardajev. 
Actually, some people thought that Ratkovic is uh, Polish, so they turned, people turned to the queen, uh, Zofia Holshanska, for help. But the queen answered that, uh, unfortunately, Ratkovic's uh, castle are in Hungary, so it is the Hungarian king who has the responsibility. In the mountain of Hovola, um, in the neighborhood of Kroshenko, there was also a big gang in the 60s. Uh, and um, the royal chamber holder pro uh, uh, um, promised to provide help to the city council in uh, Bardejov. Um, so all this shows that the Hungarian robbers um, caused uh, significant damage to Polish uh, merchants. On the other hand, uh, the archives of uh, the cities do not have enough documents, so it is not possible to establish how serious the Polish uh, robbers were and how dangerous they were against Hungarian tradesmen. So we can only assume that the Hungarian merchants had also a very, very difficult time. This shows, this is shown by um, a document from 1490. This is the, sit the letter of the city of Bardejov uh, to the members of the commission set up by the Hungarian uh, king uh, concerning the atrocities uh, by the Poles against the Hungarian merchants. Uh, this is not a very long document and it talks only about a few attacks. For example, it uh, talks about the violent acts committed by Piotr Kmita, the Lublova Starosta, the imprisonment of two uh, burghers from Bardejov by the landlord in Strizhov, and actually uh, the landlord uh, demanded seven uh, florin for releasing them. And another one, Stanislav Tsievskovsky, uh, imprisoned two other burghers and wanted eight florin for them. For these acts, uh, the Gribov uh, city councillors uh, tried to provide an explanation on what happened, and uh, they are tr they were trying to explain to the Bardayov city council that they are not responsible. Or, for example, nine uh, horses uh, were stolen by a certain Vilinsky, and uh, the damage was uh, 100 florin. Another horse theft is discussed. Osolinsky stole four horses from somebody. Mostly um, in the 15th century, something had to be done along the Polish-Hungarian border. Various measures were taken um, from the beginning of the 1450s. In 1454, in May, the representatives or councillors of uh, Bardejov uh, came together with Mikolai Pienjezik, Podolin Starosta. Uh, we know uh, about this from the letter of Andrzej Czeski, which was sent uh, to the uh, jury in the court of Bardejov. It, it was a formal invitation for a meeting between the councillors and uh, the starost, but we do not know anything about the results of this meeting. In 1461, all these uh, robberies um, came to the attention of Queen uh, Sofia, and um, she put Mikolai Pianyezek uh, in charge of dealing with this, and we hear about discussions between uh, Istvan Zapoya and uh, the governor of Upper Hungary. Uh, the meeting was in August 1463. Some documents uh, survived in the archive of Bardejov Jan Wolski, the starosta from Mushina turned to the bar, uh, Barde of uh, councillors and um, asked the councillors to send their representatives to this meeting. But um, actually, the starosta himself uh, uh, suffered a lot from uh, Thomas and his gang from Tarts. So the 
meetings and the negotiations in Nijica started and we have some information on this from a letter written on the 4th of September in 1463. From this it turns out that Jakub from Demno um, committed himself uh, to uh, pursue the robbers and uh, Zapoya did the same. But in spite of this uh, agreement, the Thomas, the gang of Thomas from Tarts continued the robberies and uh, the burghers, uh, the people living in Sandet, uh, still uh, complained a lot. Uh, so somehow Jakub from Debno assumed that uh, Zapoya was not against these robberies. And it seemed that officials, official people, didn't decide on any uh, concrete steps uh, because um, they were afraid uh, for their own security or more or less they came to an agreement with the robberies and of course they might have benefited from these robberies. Uh, proof to prove this might be the accusation of the starosta in Pretzlav in 1465. He was accused of attacking the castle of Mak Makovice. Pretzlav, in his letter to the judge in Bardayov and the jury, uh, denied these allegations. But in the very same year, he got into a very serious conflict with the Archbishop of Eger, Laszlo. Well, we cannot be very surprised hearing about the attack against uh, Makovice because, as we know, Makovice was a shelter for the robbers. It was only in 1468 when a peaceful agreement was made with Jakub Tsudar, who was uh, the commander in uh, Makovice. However, as uh, so many other agreements, it remained only in, on paper and was not executed. These attacks by the robbers along the Polish-Hungarian border caused very serious problems to both countries because uh, these actions um, against uh, the merchants were not beneficial for the economic development of this area. At the same time, both the Hungarian and the uh, Polish uh, uh, noblemen, the owners of the castle, provided shelters to the robbers um, instead of um, safeguarding the area. Actually, the reason for this is the chaos in Upper Hungary. Um, from the 15th, from the second half of the 15th uh, century, which was um, a breeding ground of uh, the activities of robbers. Uh, there was no strong political and administrative power, so automatically this led to chaotic uh, conditions and circumstances, and consequently the gangs uh, went uh, unpunished in the mountains. Both the violent methods and the peaceful negotiations were unsuccessful. So these robbers and even the campaigns of the gangs uh, were uh, models, examples to be followed. The most infamous of those is Janosik, the Slovakian uh, robber who has become a well-known figure of the legends. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs>
online listeners uh, who uh, are very grateful to you for delivering your presentation in Hungary and, and just an association. Uh, uh, your presentation reminded uh, me of the wonderful uh, short uh, stories of Crudy uh, who wrote about uh, a situation that neither Bartha or Lurch uh, had their hangman and there was a woman uh, who had magical um, skills uh, and she was waiting for her last uh, day uh, and uh, 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 instead of going uh, for her on execution, she executed the hangman one by one. Uh, uh, unfortunately, young people in Hungary uh, very rarely read these uh, fantastic short uh, stories. Uh, uh, and thank you very much again for this excellent presentation. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, one of my colleagues, uh, a director of the uh, uh, Research Center for uh, Archaeology. He is the director of the Research Center. Originally, he planned to deliver his presentation uh, with uh, Mr. Ringer, but due to technicalities, he is our only speaker today. Uh, uh, there is something uh, I sh would like to share with you about uh, uh, Mr. Makoldi. Uh, we saw or heard uh, the uh, presentation or on archaeogenetics, uh, but there are very, very nice and interesting projects going uh, at the moment, going on at the moment. Uh, for example, one of our, the projects of the Research Center for Ar uh, Archaeology is uh, a site uh, uh, related to King Samuel. Uh, we have achieved or they have achieved outstanding results with this highlighted uh, priority project. Mr. Mokoldi. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to greet everyone. Yes, indeed, uh, we prepared this presentation together with my colleague, uh, Mr. Istvan Ringer, but we had uh, uh, a parallel in invitation uh, today. Uh, so Mr. Ringer, my colleague, went to Chateau We had to a summer camp uh, um, and uh, I decided uh, to deliver the presentation here. I would like to speak about archaeology. My title is Medieval and Modern Monuments and Visibility of the House of Hunyadi. I would like uh, to scrutinize a topic that uh, is quite unheard of. Uh, uh, in the 20th century, a certain theory on the origin uh, of uh, Matthias Sunyadi emerged. Uh, this changed uh, uh, the, uh, the, the usual approach. It was already mentioned by Eva Tesler, my colleague, in her presentation. Uh, uh, King Matthias's uh, uh, father, John Hunyadi, uh, used uh, uh, the raven in his coat of arms. Uh, and uh, they borrowed uh, uh, the Hunyadi name uh, from the castle of Vaida Hunyad. Uh, uh, the picture you can see right now, the seal you can see now, it v was, uh, is, uh, 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 is a seal collected. Uh, um, uh, during the 19th century. According to uh, uh, the author, uh, uh, the Hunyadi family originates uh, from uh, the east of uh, 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 
uh, avoid the Hunyad in Transylvania. And here you can see the castle and maquette of the, the uh, castle. This is very near in our vicinity, but this is the original. Uh, uh, it was erected by King Matthias. And uh, another important castle in Serbia is the so-called Hullos Castle, uh, the castle of Raven. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this is where the raven in uh, the coat of arms originates from. You can see that they are quite near one another geographically. Matra Verabe, however, is in the hills uh, in the north uh, of Hungary. And uh, Mr. Ringer would have liked to talk about it, about the history of this ge ge geographic location. Uh, Peter Verab, deputy uh, 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 of Transylvania, sees his estates uh, around and in Matra Verabe, uh, no, sorry, in Transylvania. Uh, and uh, he inherited estates in Matra Verabe and tries to exchange his inherited estates to estates in a uh, Transylvania. We have data about Peter Verab from 1368 to 1403. In the 14th century, the Silati family also had estates around uh, uh, Matra Verabe. Uh, 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 this is the family where the wife, Erzsébet Silagyi, also originated from. And it is quite odd to see that the Silagyi family eh, also exchanges uh, estates with uh, Sigismond of uh, uh, Luxembourg. Uh, uh, estate, his estates in Matra Verabe are exchanged uh, to other estates owned by uh, 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 Sigismond. Um, uh, uh, and uh, here comes the the theory uh, that this person is identical with the son of Istvan Vereb. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, certainly identify him uh, because he died uh, uh, in uh, 1403. Uh, if we suppose. Uh, that, that he had to be 10 years old, uh, then his father could have been uh, 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 Peter Verab. Uh, the reason why he didn't use his uh, family name, uh, because he married Erzsébet or Elizabeth Silagyi, and uh, from the Silagyi family, and uh, the Verab uh, family and the uh, Silagyi family united the new uh, estates. Uh, uh, we can say that a new dynasty is born with uh, the headquarters of uh, 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 the castle of Voida Hunyad, and this is the reason why they name the family Hunyadi uh, uh, after the marriage. Um, uh, and they have the raven in their courts of arm. Uh, in Matra Vereb, the grave uh, of uh, Peter Vereb was already known in uh, 1934. And it is uh, good to say, uh, we are proud to say, that we can still find the grave uh, uh, in Matra Vereb. You can see uh, the raven uh, on the gravestone. You can read. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, where Peter um, lies here, uh, he died in 1403. He used to be deputy Voivodina of Transylvania. Uh, and the Flourish rumor, uh, uh, the famous artist, uh, Hungarian artist, uh, also used this motif uh, on the gravestone. He copied it. Uh, but here you can see uh, here uh, that uh, 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 
the bird is holding a ring. Uh, um, uh, the grave, uh, the cemetery of Matra Verabe is um, quite neglected. Uh, it is a beautiful site. It's a Gothic. Uh, uh, it was built in Gothic style. Uh, uh, it is a beautiful building uh, erected by Peter Verab. The church itself uh, is a beautiful Gothic uh, uh, monument in Hungary, which regretfully is uh, very seldom visited. Uh, 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 near Matra Verabe, there uh, is a very famous uh, route uh, of pilgrimage. Millions of people uh, visit uh, uh, the neighborhood. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the church is uh, 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 not located inside the village. Uh, it is in a... Um, um, socially deprived uh, area, and perhaps this is the reason why it is so uh, 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 seldom visited. Uh, Peter Vera was a very pious uh, Christian uh, uh, nobleman. Uh, uh, besides this church, uh, he was so uh, commissioned the uh, direction or construction of a Pauline uh, min monastery. And his example was followed by John and Matthias Hunyadi. Uh, I would uh, like to show you uh, 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 the coat of arms of the family uh, 200 years later. You can see, see that they used the symbol of the raven. Uh, uh, here, here you can see uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, a book which is also available on the internet. It was written by Leonard Frater. Uh, it is uh, on the Hungarian origin of Hunyadi uh, uh, on the basis of charters. Uh, I visited the church myself, uh, and uh, uh, I was uh, quite glad to see that uh, the coat of arms was replaced on the grave uh, stone. Uh, here you can see <coughs> Isvan Gergely, a local historian, uh, 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 who showed me uh, the whole site. Uh, uh, we have been working on a site uh, in the vicinity of Boshar. Uh, uh, the, uh, there are many, visit many visitors uh, at that site, uh, and I got to know this person from the Abashar uh, uh, archaeological site. Here uh, uh, you can see a picture. Uh, 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 the uh, the, uh, the grave uh, stone was uh, inbuilt in the wall, uh, on the vertical wall of the sanctuary, uh, in order to preserve its condition. It is very similar to the one we found in Lapograd. I would like to show you. Um, uh, uh, the um, surface plan of uh, the church. Uh, I'm showing it to you because I think it is uh, something worth comparing uh, to our uh, major, uh, most beautiful churches. The last uh, renovation uh, uh, was carried out during the life of uh, uh, Peter Vereb. Peter Vereb was an ardent uh, Christian. Uh, he renewed other uh, churches uh, in Sandgut and he established uh, a Pauline monastery. 
Uh, why? Uh, because he was uh, wounded in jail during a siege. He was taken to Matra Verebe, where he uh, drank uh, from the water of the magic well and he healed. So it was a gift uh, uh, to the village. Uh, here you can see the water of uh, the church uh, that was added later and it somehow uh, transformed uh, uh, the structure. Uh, here uh, you can see another church uh, in the vicinity uh, which originally was built in the Gothic style but later it was transformed uh, 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 into a Baroque uh, building. This is the southern main entrance. Um, you can see that uh, there are walls for uh, sculptures. They are now empty. Uh, there are only very few churches in Hungary where these walls uh, uh, remained. Uh, the original height of the sanctuary also remained. You can see that it is much higher than the present-day Baroque ceiling here. You can see the uh, uh, a part of the sanctuary, and you can see uh, uh, ground kings uh, uh, in the upper part. Uh, this was the seat uh, of uh, uh, Peter Verab, uh, uh, and uh, it was not by chance that uh, the portraits of kings appear carved in the stones. Uh, although he was only a substitute or a deputy of Vodina, but still it was a very high rank. Here you can see this uh, spiral uh, staircase leading uh, to the ceiling, it is worth uh, going up uh, because here uh, we can see the original uh, Gothic walls uh, abo above uh, the uh, Baroque style uh, uh, surface. Uh, you, you can very well see that it is about 20 to 23 meters higher uh, than the uh, Baroque uh, ceiling. Uh, here you can see um, uh, a picture, a photo of a former workshop where they made bells. Uh, uh, we also found certain findings in this site, remains of bells. Uh, uh, excavating this grave uh, would uh, perhaps justify uh, 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 with the help of our genetics, the modern science of our genetics, whether our theory is right or not. There are a few uh, obstacles. One, uh, the grave was excavated in the 1960s. You can see a contemporary uh, photograph. You can also see the two skulls uh, on top of the walls, and you can see a heap of bones in the corner, so we really very much hope that these bones were not uh, transported to one or the other uh, museum where they surely uh, would have lost, uh, and we really hope that uh, these remains, uh, skeletal and other bone remains, uh, 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 can be still excavated. Uh, 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 we suppose that there are more skulls uh, uh, than uh, um, uh, the, the graves were opened uh, and uh, And when robbers, uh, 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 perhaps uh, uh, when uh, stealing from the graves, uh, mixed uh, the different scores, uh, skulls and bones. Uh, and uh, uh, so hopefully uh, the state of the art uh, uh, science of archaeogenetics might help us uh, to reconstruct uh, the original uh, situation 
the situation of or in Lepograd, uh, something that uh, my colleague Andrew Napraski spoke about and something uh, our Croatian colleague will speak about uh, 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 is uh, uh, a very similar case uh, to our uh, uh, case. Um, the only difference is that the church in Lepograd uh, still stands. It was never destroyed by the Ottomans. Uh, and I'm on the firm belief that if we reconstructed the walls, we could find the medieval paintings uh, under the um, uh, present paint. Uh, here, in, you can see the Lepograd uh, church. Uh, uh, you can see the original Gothic water, and here you can see uh, the uh, coat of arms of the, uh, the House of Arpad, which is a proof that uh, this church was built by Hungarians. Yes, of course, because this is the place when, where John Corwin was interred. Uh, uh, during uh, the uh, uh, Turkish invasion, uh, the Pauline uh, order moved from Hungary, uh, f moved from their original place to Lepograd. Uh, so uh, thanks to God, this church was never destroyed. Of course, it was also, also transformed uh, along the Baroque style. But still, we can see very many original Gothic details. The, the original tom, uh, tombstone of John Corwin was also interred in the uh, horizontal wall of the sanctuary. And the original uh, grave uh, was covered uh, by a marble uh, uh, stone uh, uh, in 1871. I was lucky to participate uh, at uh, the excavation at the opening of the grave after 100 years uh, uh, that passed since the millennium. It was simply fantastic, uh, breathtaking to see that within uh, the grave we could see two skeletons. Uh, uh, and uh, we also found a casket. Uh, uh, on the one side, uh, we could see Johannes Corvinus. On the other side, uh, we could see the inscription Christophorus uh, Corvinus, uh, which clearly indicated uh, that the casket uh, 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 contained the bones or uh, the bone remains uh, of these two people. Uh, uh, and casters uh, of uh, King Matthias. Uh, I was the person who entered the grave, and I was the one who passed up the bones uh, to my colleagues, and I, at that time, already uh, uh, saw that, indeed, they were the descendants of King Matthias. Uh, we knew from historical sources that uh, he was sick, he was ill. John Corvin uh, was limping. Uh, he had a hip injury and uh, already there, at the first moment being in the grave, uh, I could see uh, the scars uh, and the deformation on his hip stone. And of course, I could also see that it was a man about 30 uh, years uh, a of age, and uh, the skeleton of a roughly five year old son. Uh, so for me, this was simply an unbelievable experience, something that will determine my mission or. Uh, uh, of life, uh, I was present at the excavation of the skeleton of a king. Uh, so after uh, uh, taking the, having taken the samples, uh, these remains uh, were uh, interred again uh, in the presence of, of uh, Catholic priests. And another location I would like to mention uh, uh, John uh, Corvin had a son, Christophe, uh, 
Christopher, who was uh, buried together with him in Lepograda. Then there was another son who died when he was one, and we do not know where he was interred. But he also had a daughter, Elizabeth, who was uh, uh, buried in Jula in the sanctuary of uh, the Franciscan Church, you can see here. Uh, and uh, few people know about it, even the inhabitants of Dulop are perhaps unaware of the significance uh, of uh, this site. Unfortunately, the whole site uh, was uh, destroyed uh, by the Turks. Uh, uh, we could find uh, uh, the uh, the graves, uh, but uh, they were almost empty. Uh, so unfortunately, we cannot carry out a genetic uh, uh, examination or identification because there are no bone remains. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, the location should be somehow added to uh, the subjects of the Hunyadi research. And if we turn back to Matra Verabe, uh, no matter whether Frater's uh, theory holds or not, uh, uh, we can say that Matra Verabe is Sekesvehervar and uh, uh, other Christian uh, Serbian, sorry, Serbian uh, sites. Uh, and, uh, Void Hunyad Castle, which now belongs to Romania, uh, clearly indicates that a clear cut uh, line in the Carpathian Basin that is worth uh, studying uh, parallelly. Thank you very much for your attention. I thank our colleague, Director Miklos Makoldi, for this uh, indeed interdisciplinary research and this paper. In the morning, we heard a paper from uh, our colleague Naparatsky, and uh, that paper is uh, in unity with uh, this one, and of course. Uh, I would also like to refer to Eva Teisler's and Jörg uh, Domokos, uh, who also had excellent uh, papers from a different perspectives. Uh, so, after the previous uh, paper, I gave you a uh, homework to read uh, Jula Krudi's uh, short stories. Uh, but uh, actually, um, they worked have been translated into a lot of uh, languages, uh, maybe also into Polish and Italian, Jula Krudi, about uh, the, uh, about left. So I think it uh, would be worth visiting those places that Miklos was talking about, Matra, Verebe, uh, Lepoglava, the castle of um, Hunedwara, and uh, Bardejov uh, and other wonderful cities in the upper Hungary. So after the conference, you will have a lot to do. But let's continue our conference. Uh, I said that Miklos Makoli is my colleague, and uh, so is the next speaker, Marton Kailoki Gyöngyösi. So I am um, head of uh, the language history research at the Institute, and uh, as such, I'm also the colleague of Marton Karnoki, who is going to talk about the monetary reform. But I'm not expert on monetary experts, but I checked that uh, Miklos uh, Marton Karnoki is. He has a lot of publications uh, in this area now. We will hear his paper on the Great Monetary Reform and its impact, Monetary Reform of Matyas Hunyadi and the Moneta Nova. So the floor is yours, Marton Karnoki Gyöngyösi. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. 
This is um, an issue which is dear to my heart, and I have been dealing with this for two decades. Uh, from Professor Andras Kubinyi, I received uh, the first inspiration, and I'm always very glad to return to this issue. Yes, I think it's um, really justified to say that this monetary reform is the great monetary reform of King Matthias, and I'm going to uh, compare this to the other reform of uh, King Louis II in 1521. So we need to talk about the events and impacts of these two monetary reforms. This is uh, very important because the evaluation of these reforms was different in different historical uh, periods. Uh, from the perspective of economic history, we have the following uh, fact. The great monetary reform of King Matthias between uh, 1467 to 1470 was not mentioned uh, even by Lajos Tallozzi. He was just talking about the bad money of the great uh, king, and um, maybe only once he talks about the newly minted uh, denarius, and he said that uh, the reforms, the financial administration uh, measures were smart. Why? Why? Because we have no written source on the monetary reform. Our primary source is the coins, the mints. As opposed to this, the other monetary reform, the one in 1521, uh, was evaluated in detail already at the end of the 19th century. It was the final instrument of bad management, they said. So I will talk about these two reforms in parallel and compare them to be able to evaluate the two reforms. So who, whose brainchild was uh, Matthias's reform? It was uh, Janos Ernust. Um, who was born in Vienna. He was a converted Jew, and um, he was a merchant in Buda in 1458. In 1462, he was a supplier of the royal court, uh, a burgher of Buda, and uh, in 1464, he was part of uh, the first centralized financial administration. Of course, he had a role to play in the monetary reform of Matthias because he was the treasurer in 1467, and he continued to have this position until 1476 when he died. It was not just a minting reform, but it was about a fully centralized financial administration. The collection of taxes and also the collection of the levies were centralized. This person, Ernst Janos, John Ernest, was a genius. Uh, he also benefited from this. He had mines and estates in the upper uh, upper Hungary and also in the south uh, southern part of Hungary. Uh, from the 1473 until his death, he was also a Slavon ban, but Matyas for a, a short period of time lost his trust in him, but then he regained this confidence. Well, uh, there is discussion on who was uh, the, 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 the person who inspired the Moneta Nova. I think that it was Imre Serencés, originally Salomo Seneor Ben Ephraim, who was not willing uh, to convert to Christianity. He was a Jew and he had to leave his uh, country in 1492. Most probably he went to Italy and then came with his family to Hungary. He was one of the, mo the, the richest merchants if, of uh, Buddha, left uh, his uh, family due to a love affair, and he married um, the daughter of uh, a German citizen, Anna Held, who uh, gave uh, birth to a boy. Actually, Serencis was the financial advisor of King uh, Louis II, and the Jewish um, people uh, found that he was the supporter of uh, Jews, and he had very serious connections to Italy, and he had uh, been uh, uh, managing the capital of uh, noble men. And uh, actually, he wanted to exclude the Fuggers uh, from uh, the country. 
and uh, actually he was a deputy treasurer. He had this position um, several times. Uh, the Diet in 1525 wanted to burn him and he was imprisoned but then released. And then uh, the Fuggers, his uh, adversaries, uh, uh, motivated uh, or incited um, uh, the, the burghers uh, and Serencic had to flee. But then um, he took revenge and from the Fuggers he took uh, the copper trade. Uh, he died uh, at the end of uh, the summer 1526 uh, and actually this was the end of the financial elite in Hungary. This was not the very first time in Hungarian uh, uh, history of money that uh, Jewish people provided financial advice to the king because their economic and financial knowledge and experience uh, in trade made them suitable for this position. So as we saw in the case of these um, two medieval monetary reforms, uh, the Jewish financial advisors and merchants who converted to Christianity and who were integral part of the political elite drove and managed and executed the reforms. As for King Matthias, he was a very, uh, well, great uh, ruler and he was an active uh, participant of the monetary reform. So the pattern on the coin changed on the front of the golden um, coin and on the back of the silver uh, coin Virgin Mary was uh, printed Patrona Hungariae. Well, the respect for uh, Virgin Mary has been known for a long time. And uh, actually, this uh, change was not really motivated uh, by just a general ideology. This was the actual will and intention of Matthias to have this um, pattern on the coin. As for Louis, King Louis uh, II of Hungary, well, he was uh, a young person. We do not know whether or not he had very good skills as a ruler. Um, in the course of Moneta Nova, we do not see any will of, uh, of the king, as we do in the case of Matthias. Uh, these uh, coins were of uh, worse quality, and uh, actually the previous motives, uh, the former motives uh, were kept, uh, and also the inscription said moneta nova but otherwise um, uh, it was not an original so um, the issuing authority is the king and in the two reforms the kings played a different role in the previous the king was proactive who participated in the processes who had expectations concerning the pattern the design of the coin whereas uh, the second uh, king was just uh, acting out of necessity and uh, was not very active uh, and autonomous uh, in the monetary reform. Well, King Matthias uh, didn't do anything else, uh, then took the moneta mayor, uh, the silver coin from the period of Sigismund as a model, and uh, he put an end to the undermining of the currency. The exchange rate it was one golden uh, florin was 100 denarius. And the garage was also printed, minted uh, again. Uh, the ratio of the value of the gold and uh, the silver was 1 to 12. However, uh, the the value, actually, the ratio of the value was 1 to 8. It meant that the treasury overestimated uh, the silver denar and devalued the golden uh, florin. Actually, uh, Ernust Janos, Janos Ernust, uh, tried to regulate uh, the money issued, and this is how they wanted uh, to achieve uh, stability. And there was uh, a crisis in 1480, and after the crisis, uh, the uh, minting of silver coins was terminated in Bayamare. 
Um, we have a decree from 1467, however, this doesn't contain any uh, description or any information on the minting. But um, uh, in 1521, uh, King Louis II issued uh, silver coins of uh, worse quality. Uh, actually, three fourths of uh, the coin was copper and only one fourth was uh, silver. In 1521, there were only two mints. Uh, silver mints in Kremnica and in Buda. And in 1523, it seemed that the monetary reform is slowing down, so new measures uh, had to be taken. On the one hand, in uh, 1523, at the National Assembly, at the Diet, um, um, a, a lot of decrees and laws were adopted on the raw material and on the new money, and uh, the noblemen and uh, also the, the high-ranking uh, priests offered a large amount of uh, silver and um, they established new mints and uh, private mints also received licenses. So when Moneta Nova was introduced, Hungary uh, had to import silver, which was unthinkable before. So from uh, Tyrol, silver was uh, bought. The chronology of the reform can be traced uh, based on the stamps. And we also have a lot of uh, written sources on corrections. Ernst was very careful and gradual. And he diverted uh, the value of the precious metal from the global exchange rates of uh, the gold and uh, silver, so um, overestimated or raised the, the, the value of uh, the silver. Serencic, uh, the other person, drastically uh, decreased the precious metal content of the silver. If there is such a very strong step, the economy always reacts nervously and fast, and Serencic had to know this in advance, so Serencic only uh, benefited in the short term. The monetary reform of Matyash stable, stabilized uh, the exchange rate of the golden foreign and silver dinar, which was beneficial for the Hungarian economy. Interest dropped after 1470 from 10% to 4 to 5%. And um, the uh, group of um, uh, uh, capitalists dealing with import and export were separated. The previous were foreigners and the exporters were Hungarian who accumulated wealth uh, due to um, animal expert and the um, countryside burgers in Hungarian cities if, uh, developed. Uh, and also the foreigners accumulated wealth because when they reaped uh, the benefits of their uh, activities, they could exchange uh, these into golden florins. Of course, um, the public finances, the central government didn't directly fill these uh, reforms. Matyash had um, uh, revenues uh, which amounted to 500 to 750,000 uh, gold uh, florins. In uh, the 1480s, maybe 43,000 golden florins uh, was reaped from the minting. Well, if we want to understand the reform of Moneta Nova, we have to talk about the face value and the metal value. It is a known fact that um, the value of the golden florint and the calculation forint uh, uh, were separated from one another because uh, the new denarius contained only half of the silver as the previous ones. So their, well, in principle, uh, their value also uh, dropped to uh, half. Uh, in uh, 1521, 100 uh, uh, denar was the exchange rate, and in 1522, so one year later, uh, 250 denars uh, was, uh, was um, the, the value of one golden foreign. Uh, so f for, uh, 100, for 100 uh, old denars, uh, 110 had to be given. 
and uh, as for the metal value, it was uh, decreased, and this also led to uh, the decrease of the face value. The exchange rate, the change of the exchange rate, uh, gives uh, an answer to the question what impact the Moneta Nova had on the financial standing of the country. One thing is uh, for sure um, the reform didn't meet its objective. It couldn't uh, uh, neutralize the, the deficit of the public finances, and it couldn't cover the costs of the anti-Ottoman wars. The monetary reform of uh, Matthias brought stability in the long run, whereas um, King uh, Louis II undermined the currency, and they didn't have a good answer to the exchange rate fluctuations. So after the withdrawal of Moneta Nova, the well-established system of Antica Moneta was returned to. Well, the monetary reform of Matthias has been very well known in Hungarian numismatics. In, in the 20th century, uh, there are two studies, Lajos Hussar and Artur Paul's studies, discussing the money and reform of Matthias. However, uh, from an economic uh, history perspective, there was no such evaluation. It was Andreas Kubinyi who realized that uh, the reform brought about monetary changes by the stable exchange rate and emission. And after further studies and under the guidance of Professor Kubini, I did the analysis and summary of the reform in terms of Münzgeschichte and Geldgeschichte. Lajos Talloci also talked about uh, the monetary reforms uh, in 1521. However, uh, data relating to the Moneta Nova uh, was uh, summarized by Geza Yesensi, and later on, Zsuzsanna Herman uh, corrected uh, the inaccuracies of Yesensky. Andras uh, Kubini based his views on these two authors. However, he had a different opinion on the role of uh, Imre Serencés. George Shimon and uh, Norbert C. Toth uh, also has, uh, have um, studies which are rich in data. From the above, we can easily see that uh, both the numismatics, uh, the uh, money or monetary uh, reform history and economic history research highly appreciates uh, Matthias's monetary reform. And uh, its significance equals the significance of launching minting and coining in Hungary. But the same does not apply to the uh, undermining the currency in 1521, which is a negative record. Today, uh, related to the research uh, into the battlefield in Mohac, um, this issue is on the agenda again. There is a newly established research team, a Mohaj research uh, team, which gives um, a new perspective and a different um, evaluation of the Jagellians uh, and the Hunyadis. Uh, they overestimate the Jagellos and underestimate the Hunyadis uh, role. Well, of course, I do not wish to doubt the research uh, project. Uh, but I think that no far-fetched conclusions uh, should be made, um, at least as uh, regards the history of uh, money. One member of this research team, OASH research team, a few years ago published a study on the success of the reform in 1521. So I think it's just one little step um, to call and reevaluate the great monetary reform of 1467 as being unsuccessful. There is one question. In 1522, an extra amount of tax was collected, but how? In new? or antique uh, money, or in both. We do not know this, so that remains a question. As long as we do not know if these taxes were collected in new money or old money, we cannot talk about success or unsuccess. Uh, I think a taxpayer is uh, ready to get rid of uh, uh, money which is not worth anything. 
whereas they want to keep good money for worse times. So I think that um, the quality of uh, the money may have an impact on compliance, compliance to pay taxes. Um, and uh, this member of this research team, this researcher, actually answered my question in a footnote. He said that my question is irrelevant because uh, the revenues and the expenditures were all calculated in Florence. But I still think that it would be necessary uh, to carry out economic analysis. And my original question is still relevant, I think. And finally, the primary sources of uh, numismatic research are the coins themselves. So we need to evaluate uh, the object themselves um, together with um, other perspectives, archaeological perspectives, art historical perspective, etc. We saw that uh, the great monetary reform between 1467 and 1470 um, can all only be discussed uh, if we use or if we take a look at uh, the money itself, the coin itself. So I think that the interdisciplinary attitude or interdisciplinary approach should be given more emphasis. And I trust uh, that uh, we can start a conversation, a dialogue uh, on this. I'm sure that the numismatists are ready to engage in such a conversation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I thank Kaloki, Mr. Kaloki Gyöngyösi for this presentation, which was very interesting, not, on, not only because um, he was talking about uh, economic history and its relations to Mohac, but it was also very interesting because, um, because I think that if the question uh, Kailo Kijanjashi raised uh, was irrelevant whether tax was collected in antique or new money, as it's not irrelevant, but if it was uh, irrelevant, then from tomorrow I will start paying my personal uh, taxes, uh, you know, in uh, forints um, from before 1940. So it would be a very good idea. So no question, your question is relevant. So thank you very much. And um, now we are going to have Dr. Jörg Domokos, who is going to talk about uh, some specific documents from the period of 1490-1491. Of course, uh, the Vestige uh, research project is very significant, and uh, he is the head of this research team. And uh, it also relates uh, to the paper of Madame uh, Carpentieri that we heard in the morning. And uh, we went to university together when we pursued Italian studies. And in addition to Vestigia, there are a lot of uh, research, research projects uh, that he is involved in, and he also um, teaches in Bratislava right now. The floor is yours. First of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, indeed, we started our university studies together roughly 40 years ago. It is a great honor uh, that in this beautiful place, in the company of such prestigious uh, people, I can deliver my presentation uh, on our research uh, by the Catholic University of Budapest. The title of my presentation is John uh, Corvin, some specific documents from the period of uh, 1490, 1491. 
uh, Italian archives within the framework of the Vestigia project. Uh, our uh, 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 project is titled Vestigia or Vestigia in Latin. These are traces. This means traces. Uh, we received support or grant between 2010 and 2015. Our objective, as it was told by Mr. Chairman, is uh, to uh, explore Hungarica between uh, 1300 and uh, 1550, digitalization and research in Italian archives and uh, uh, libraries. Uh, uh, there are two selected cities in the first cycle, Milan and Modena. The reason for that is that in the given period, uh, there used to be two Italian courts uh, uh, that was the uh, uh, main uh, point of orientation for the Agalonians and uh, the Hungarian court. Uh, in 2018, during the autumn period, we started the second phase. Uh, new towns, were, cities were involved. Uh, we hope uh, that also Naples, Turin, uh, Turin and other Tuscan cities uh, will be involved in the third uh, uh, phase that will hopefully come true. What are achievements? More than 3,000 uh, mainly unpublished sources were uh, uh, explored. Uh, we submitted them uh, to the uh, registration of the Hungarian National Archives uh, and uh, uh, also submitted uh, copies to uh, the uh, diplomatic uh, photo collection of the archives. Uh, uh, how is it that we were able to find so many unpublished uh, sources, although uh, it is well known that there are very many sources to be detected in Italy? Yes, uh, as our Italian colleague mentioned in the morning session, uh, it is one thing that we know about sources, but right now, given the new uh, techniques, we can also digitalize them. Uh, this is the reason why we created an open access uh, database. Uh, you can see it uh, uh, in the left uh, uh, top corner. Uh, so these documents are uploaded uh, in this open access database. Uh, they are searchable. And uh, within the framework of the research, one monography and three volumes of studies, uh, 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 were prepared uh, where uh, different uh, sources were presented, letters, etc. Uh, several articles, uh, presentations in Hungary and abroad also uh, present our uh, route during the research. Of course, we base our research on our predecessors, uh, Modena, which is perhaps the richest in sources. The first uh, researcher was Albert Nyari, who emigrated after the revolution, the fall of the revolution in 1848. Uh, he uh, initiated uh, uh, a process uh, uh, when uh, uh, these manuscripts were copied Ivan Nagy, Vilmos Fraknoi, and Albert Berzevici could be mentioned here, who commissioned the Hungarian-Italian experts who copied uh, these account uh, documents, uh, letters, and documents by hand. Uh, these documents can be found today in uh, the collection of manuscripts of the Hungarian Academy of Science. Science uh, uh, but uh, nobody thought, uh, uh, but everybody thought that this was all that referred to Hungary, that was related to Hungary in Italy. Uh, uh, in the First World War, uh, Italy 
uh, joined the war against Hungary, and this whole wonderful, marvelous period ended. The codices were sent back uh, to Hungary. The copying process stopped. Uh, and uh, this is the reason uh, why uh, the uh, manuscripts uh, stored in uh, the uh, uh, Academy of Sciences uh, is not the total uh, collection. Uh, our original objective was that by 2015 we will have uh, finished uh, the work, but unfortunately, or fortunately, we were not able to to make this achievement because we found much more sources than we expected. So, um, based on the works of these four gentlemen, uh, the major monographies uh, were created. Uh, um, these uh, monographies are uh, uh, full of data, and they somehow shaped our mentality about the age. Uh, so, uh, right now, what I would like to present to you and it is a little bit uh, different from the methodology of my Italian colleague, I would like to concentrate or focus on five documents uh, related uh, to Matthias Corvin. Right now, uh, we can reinterpret uh, the original text, uh, and there are further documents which are still not incorporated in the Hungarian historiography. The first document I would like to speak about here, you can see the vestigian number. Uh, this is an identification number. So within the project, we use uh, uh, a special uh, numerology uh, that will remain in the DLDL system as well. Uh, uh, so here you can see the registration number, then the date, uh, uh, and then a name, Mafio da Dreveio, uh, who was a spy of Ludovico Sforza, in fact, uh, an agent, uh, and uh, April 1490 is uh, 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 a very special uh, division line. The, after the death of Matthias, the correspondence between the Italian and the Hungarian court flourished. John Corvin, as we have already heard, was uh, uh, the spouse uh, of uh, the Countess of the Duchess of Milan, uh, and. Uh, 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 it was the interest of many courts that he should be the successor of Matthias. Uh, 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 this strong country of Hungary uh, was uh, uh, in the focus of uh, power interests. Uh, uh, lots of people wanted to, to grab or seize uh, the reign. I would like to read the first line. Perhaps I. Unfortunately, you cannot see it. Unde optimam spam gerimus quod nemo alter nisi ipsi nominus noster dominus Johannes Corvinus dux dux liptoviensis and opaviensis in regem constituetur. <laughs> Not long after the death of Matthias, it is. Uh, spy from Lombard Lombardy uh, reports to the Duke of uh, Milan uh, saying uh, that uh, we have high hopes uh, that uh, John Corvin, uh, uh, Duke of Lipto and Opava, will become the heir of Matthias. That was the interest of Milan and that was an optimum, uh, an optimistic forecast. Uh, we never knew, we can never know whether he wrote the truth or he just wanted to favor the Duke, but that's, that's uh, one thing is for sure. Everyone in Milan wanted to read this. Uh, at, uh, at the time, uh, the Duchess of Milan uh, 
was engaged by the future Hungarian king. You can see a line drawn by pencil uh, on the left hand side. Uh, is the red uh, pencil of uh, Albert Berzavici, who usually indicated or marked uh, with red or uh, blue uh, the text he wanted to be copied. From now on, the, you will see Italian text, text, text uh, Gian Galeas the Forza, he is the Duke, uh, writes uh, to Maffeo to the Travia in Buddha. Da Ferra, Rossima, Iama, Vesati, Eri, De Boemi, Esser Stato, Elector, Ri di Ungheria, e che ha pigliato la regina per morire. There is an enormous scandal because there is rumor in uh, uh, Ferrara that it is not John de Corvin who became the king, but the Czech king took the reign and he married. Uh, Patrick, Patrick of Aragon. Uh, we know the story. Uh, it was uh, a marriage when there were formal mistakes, errors, and uh, 10 years are required to annihilate uh, uh, the marriage by the Holy Seat. So we can see that in Milan and in Padova, Padua, um, there was a panic. Uh, about these news, because at that moment uh, it seemed that John Corwin would not win. Uh, uh, probably uh, the news was, was premature. Uh, in uh, April 1419, Ladislaus was very far from being elected as a king, but uh, the instruction is. Uh, uh, the following desideramo che distintamente ne avvisi in quale termine si trovano quelle cose di là e chi che ha prestato maggiore favore in questa lezione come eh, usciranno le cose dal duce Giovanna please send us precise information about the state of uh, 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 of uh, the, the present state, uh, who has a more favorable uh, situation as far as uh, the election is concerned, uh, because at that time it was perhaps not worth uh, uh, planning the marriage anymore. Right now we are just uh, jumping to Modena, to the archives in Mod uh, Modena. Um, from the end of the 16th century, this was the seat uh, of the Esther uh, Dukes uh, and uh, the whole archives uh, at Tomodina at that time. Uh, it is quite a miracle that the archives should be prevented the normal fate of archives. There was no demolition, no uh, injury. Uh, but Rama Custabili, uh, uh, servant of uh, Kathleen uh, of Aragon, writes to the Duke. Insino a questa ora non si è fatto l'azione del re. Li prelati e baroni sono divisi in due parti. L'una delle quelle tiene come il figlio del re. So, so far, the king has not been elected. Uh, <clears throat> the priests and the aristocrats are divided into two parties. One party uh, uh, supports uh, the heir and the son of the deceased uh, king. This is the precise description of the situation. Uh, uh, both in Ferrara and in Milan, uh, 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 there are reports arriving on the concrete persons uh, in favor of one or the other alternate alternatives. Ancora il duca Corvino già sono giorni di ecce che al se partate di qua in salutato ospite. Again, we are in Modena. 
Tadeo Lardi, governor of Eger. Uh, his total correspondence containing of uh, 75 letters uh, will be published in the near future. It is very rich in tiny details uh, that uh, were only recorded by the curious Italians. Uh, uh, celebrations in Buddha, for example, or as, as strong, uh, logical devices used by the king, uh, something that uh, the duke would also like to order, um, the legate of the holy seat, how he behaved himself, etc. In 1503, John Corwin uh, uh, got into a much more inferior position. He lost the favor of the new king. Uh, and this letter from uh, 1503, June, uh, reports an, an event uh, that is that has not been witnessed by anyone else. Uh, uh, John Corwin uh, uh, left the place 10 days ago without saying goodbye at around midnight. He was... Uh, 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 irritated because the Voivodina and the Chancellor spoke to him in a very strange manner. It seems that we will make peace with the Turks, but we will have an internal war instead. Uh, Tadeo Lardi stays in Eger or with uh, Tomasz Bakots, but he hears every little bit of uh, uh, courtly rumors and he just reports on them. Uh, we are talking about uh, the uh, Crown Council here. John Corwin uh, uh, works uh, at the border. He defends Hungary against the Ottomans. Uh, and without uh, saying goodbye uh, to the king, uh, he has to leave. He is violated. He is hurt. Uh, and perhaps it is John Bornemisa, the, the, the keeper of uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, royal uh, chambers uh, who uh, doesn't behave properly. Soon uh, uh, after that, he dies. Uh, we saw his grave where he was interred together with his five-year-old son. And this is the last document I would like to show you. Uh, it was also written by Taddeo Tade Lardi. Delle nuove altre di qua sono pochi giorni che figlio del duca Corvino è morto. La decisa di veleno che lei ha fatto per ancora non si intende. As far as the news, uh, are concerned. A few days ago, the son of uh, Duke Corvin vo uh, died. Perhaps he was poisoned. Who poisoned him is a mystery so far. Perhaps uh, it was just rumors. Uh, but what came to my mind is that when you open the graves and you examine the bones, uh, uh, the, ske the skeletal remains, you might find traces of the poison. It would be interesting to, to hear about. Uh, besides that, uh, we also carried out research in Biblioteca Estense, which is famous for its collection of uh, 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 Corvina, Corvine, and uh, there is a precise and interesting description of the Siege of Buddha in 1541. We will publish an article, an essay on that in September. We have translated the whole document uh, into Hungarian because we think that the previous translations are very outdated. They were published 100 years ago, so there were certain things, uh, certain parts that we had to retranslate in modern uh, Hungarian. In the vestigial documents, we can trace his, uh, we can find traces uh, 
uh, of uh, certain events and personalities who mentioned uh, at this conference today. For example, we can find uh, some news about the outlaws. Uh, uh, for example, it is very difficult to transport goods uh, because there are great uh, dangers, imminent dangers around Zagreb, even when goods are transported. And especially, it is very risky to carry money. Uh, in these accountancy books, uh, we can follow uh, how the Hungarian money is transported uh, physically. There are certain... Uh, um, uh, chapters uh, on Hungarian money, uh, perhaps uh, due to the fact that my colleague mentioned, uh, because they were special, the whole commerce, uh, furs, uh, weapons, uh, horses, silver, uh, 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 were transported. The routes can be also followed in the air types, uh, and also the V uh, and the vehicle. They were carried, these were vehicles prepared in court, uh, uh, a Hungarian village. Uh, uh, the stamp here is not the stamp of King Matthias, but it is the, the seal of uh, uh, Ladislaus II. But it is so beautiful, that is the reason why I took a photo and I wanted to show it to you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much to George Domokos. This was a paper that has framed our day and everything that we have heard so far. It's like uh, putting a mosaic together. This is a really interdisciplinary perspective that we uh, take now to this and I think that this research team collects a huge amount of data which is very relevant and we have heard that uh, old sources can be re-evaluated in light of new data. Thank you very much for keeping the time limit because uh, we were a bit behind our agenda. I would like to thank everybody following us on the internet for their attention and also for those who are sitting here in this impressive uh, Romanesque uh, hall, which uh, is really rich for the spirit, for the soul. I would like to thank all my colleagues for their participation and the technical stuff. Now we are going to have a coffee break of 20 minutes. So could you please uh, tell me what time it is now because I do not have my watch right. So I think that I think we should uh, continue at 3.40. Okay, so we should come back at 3.40. I'm telling everybody here and on the internet that now we are going to have a coffee break and we continue at 15.40, 3.40. And thank you very much again for your participation in this session.
Kedves vendégeink, lassan kezdődik a, záró, a mai napi záró szekciónk, úgyhogy kérnék mindenkit foglalja el a helyét. Dear guest, we will continue our conference. Please sit down. Kedves hallgatóság, akkor egy kis figyel. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? So far, we have had a very interesting day at this conference, but I think that this session is going to be extremely exciting as well. The first speaker will be Vesna Pascutini Uraga. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Madame Pascutini Uraga. I'm really grateful to her because uh, it is uh, indispensable for the Croatian partner to participate in our research and Vesna has been a very important partner. Uh, she was there, she followed our research in Croatia in uh, Lepoglava, and uh, she is very positive. She has shown a very positive attitude to an area which is not so very well known. So thank you very much again for your support uh, of our research. And on behalf of the Institute, uh, I can tell you that we are very glad to have you here in Hungary, and uh, we hope that we will be able to welcome you uh, several other times as well. Today she is going to talk about the Croatian-Hungarian presence and activities of uh, Janos Korvin, John Korvin. This is the issue that she is going to talk about and she is going to share some 
internal information with the audience why Lapoglava is important for uh, Croatia and what John Corvin means for Croatia. The floor is yours. Uh, to all of you, um, first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, so, thank you for nice words. Uh, I'm coming from the uh, northern part of Croatia, from town Varaždin. This is the center of Varaždin County and uh, Lepoglava, where we have uh, this uh, archaeogenetical uh, excavations, uh, is also in Varaždin uh, County. So uh, I'm working in the Ministry of Culture of Republic Croatia in Conservation Department in uh, town Varaždin, and I'm the head of the department. And uh, I'm art historian, so I will today um, share with you in my presentation uh, some of my researches uh, made uh, through my PhD uh, study that are uh, also connected in a way with the uh, family of King Matthias Corvinus. So, okay. So, uh, the name of my presentation is A Keystone from the Parish Church of St. Nicholas in Varaždin, a connection with the family of the King Matthias Corvinus. Uh, here you can see uh, the map of uh, Varaždin County. Uh, in the left uh, corner you see the map of Croatia. And you can also see the placement of the Varaždin County in, the, uh, Croatian, uh, in Croatia. And the center is the town Varaždin. And you can also see here Lepoglava. Can I point it? it? No, okay. You can also see the town Lepoglava in the, on the left side of the Varaždin County. So, uh, the city of Varaždin, as the seat of Varaždin County, is located in a fertile valley along the river Drava. The first written document about Varaždin dates back in the year of 1181, when it was mentioned in the charter issued by the Croatian-Hungarian king Bela III. Varaždin, as the first of the cities of continental Croatia, acquires the status of the royal borough already in the year 1209, which was awarded by Andrew II. Uh, here you can also see this uh, certificate uh, that is kept in the city museum of town Varaždin. Uh, that uh, with this certificate, King Matthias Corvinus grants the, and confirms the free and royal city of Varaždin, the coat of arms, and the right to use the city stamp. Uh, the parish church of St. Nicholas is located in the center of Varaždin, near the ancient southern city gate. The present church is a Baroque building with a Gothic bell tower. The church was mentioned for the first time in the year 1334 as already existing church in list of parish churches in the Diocese of Zagreb. The Gothic bell tower has embedded a replica of the coat of arms of the city of Varaždin. Here you can see the original uh, that was removed, restored, and stored in a collection of stone monuments in the City Museum of Varaždin. Coat of arms originates from the end of the 15th century. The same coat of arms is also found on the seal of Varaždin City Municipality, confirmed by the King Matthias Corvinus in year 14, 1464. It is not known if the coat of arms was originally positioned on the bell tower or somewhere else in the church, but it is most likely that, it, that this is the original position. On the same story of the tower, there is a year 1494 carved in, and the coat of arms dates from the same period. It is the time the old Romanesque church is renovated, and if the King Matthias Corvinus was one of the donors, it is natural that his symbols as well 
are uh, keystone and the coat of arms are to be marked on the bell tower. Until now, there were no connections made between the coat of arms of the city of Varazin, confirmed by the King Matthius Corvinus, embedded in the bell tower, and Matthius Corvinus is probable donator for the renovation of the church at the end of the 15th century. At the same site once stood the old medieval parish church. The visitations mentioned that the church was built completely of stone. This large amount of stone material was used at the construction site of the 18th century when the church was rebuilt. This secondary used material gives us the only information about the possible appearance of the older church. Below the entire surface of the present church, there is a large crypt. While cleaning the crypt, it became possible to truly examine the walls where a variety of spolia from earlier phases of in its constructions are built in. After the examination of those approachable, the conclusion is that the spolia are from two earlier phases of constructions of the church and they differ in a type of stone and the style of carving. So you can see here, that's me in this coat with a hat because it's very cold inside the crypt. And this is the restorer uh, uh, and we were together examining these uh, stone elements. Smaller amount of spolia are made out of gray sandstone and they are likely remains of the Romanesque phase of the church. Here you can see one such example. Okay. The other and numerous type of spolia are all made of yellow limestone and they originate from the Gothic period. Some of them were recognized as part of the Gothic art trips. Based on the analysis of carving styles and details of the art trips, along with the comparison with the art trips similar shapes and dimensions that are found in some other churches in the region, like Church of St. Mary in Remetinets, Church of St. Peter in Petrovsko, and Church of St. Martin in Prozorje and others, the preserved remains of the arch ribs embedded, embedded in the walls of the crypt could be dated in the second half of the 15th century. One of the elements embedded in the western wall was particularly interesting because the visible part looked like a part of a keystone. On the initiative of the Con Conservation Department of Varaždin, together with the uh, priest and the uh, Varazdin diocese, this element was removed from the wall for closer ex examination. It is a keystone and it has an engraved, engraved shield with a relief depiction on its base. It is a card from a single block of stone, yellow limestone, and it is molded with two parallel carvings on the side. The art ribs are spread, spreading readily from the keystone. The relief on the keystone is representing the coat of arms. In its central part is represented a bird, on the left upper part the letter N, and on the right upper part the severed pointed star. Although the bird is partially damaged, its shape is recognizable. There are traces of reddish color still visible on the legs. The tail and the legs of the bird are well preserved and precisely carved. On this basis, we can conclude that this is the work of a skillful craftsman. The keystone originates from the same period as the ribs, the second half of the 15th century. Searching for the comparative material, I came across some very similar representation of coat of arms on the keystone in the castle of Janos Hunyadi, father of Matius Korvinos, Hunyadi Castle in Honeduara in Romania. 
There was also representation of a bird on the shield. The coat of arms in Huanaduara belongs to the Hunyadi family, and it had six pointed star on the one side and a half moon on the other side of the bird. The bird uh, carved on the coat of arms is raven, the animal Amatius Corvinus took uh, his name after, or Latin Corvus. A similar drawing on the bird can be found on other uh, places, like comparison with uh, coat of arms of uh, Corvin family. So, we can see here. So the coat of arms in Varaždin's medieval church can be connected with family Corvin, Hunyadi, based on a similarity in the presentation and the placement of the bird, as well as the similar quality of carving and the representation of the star. After the death of Jan Vitovac in the early 1490, the king Matthias Corvinus gave to his son Ivanish Corvinus the city of Varaždin along with many other estates. Ivanish Corvinus was in the 1495 named governor of Dalmatia, Croatia, and Slavonia, which is one of the mo mostly part of today's Croatia. These are historical uh, regions of Croatia. After his death in 1504, he was buried at his own request in the crypt of the Church of the Blessed Virgin in Lepoglava together with his son, Krista. So maybe it was said some words today about Lepoglava and I didn't plan to talk about, but I will tell you maybe a few words about Lepoglava. Lepoglava has a very important uh, place uh, in uh, Croatian history, especially uh, in, as a humanist uh, place because uh, first, the church had two Gothic phases, uh, first one in year 14,000, uh, and then a second one in the 15th century. And uh, as we know, uh, one of the donors uh, of the building, this second phase of the church, was also uh, Ivanish Korvin, together with his wife, uh, Beatric, Beatric Frankopan. And Beatrice Frankopan uh, was uh, a member of very important Croatian noble family, Frankopan, uh, and Ivanish wanted to be uh, buried there. After that uh, period, the, this uh, estate, Lepoglava, uh, uh, became a famous Paulin monastery uh, during the Baroque time, and in, in this time it was the center of uh, philosophic and uh, uh, liturgic university in this region of Croatia, and also many important uh, people uh, lived there and worked. Uh, for instance, uh, Ivan Belostenec, who wrote a uh, famous dictionary, Gazofilatium, and also other uh, famous uh, artists like Ivan Iškrstetar Ranger, who was uh, one of the most famous uh, Baroque painting, painters in Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, later on, Lepoglava has a rather tragic story because uh, after the Pauline order uh, in the end of the 18th century was uh, by uh, Josef II uh, of Austro-Hungarian ruler uh, 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 closed, this uh, monastery became a prison. So, uh, ever since Lepoglava until this day has a big prison there, and maybe that's why these remains of Ivanish Korvin and his son was, were preserved there, because it was always a strength, strong protection in the town of Lepoglava because of this prison. So, let's uh, go back to my... Uh, okay. So, uh, further, the letter N was compared, uh, compared with the locate, uh, which is located on the left upper side of the coat of arms. Here we can see the letter N and the star. Uh, it was, I, I compared it with the letter M, which is located in the center of the keystone that was built in the church of St. Michael in Mihovljan. The keystone is kept in the Museum of Međimurje because church uh, no longer exi exists. 
Mihovljan is placed in the center of Međimurje, which is the northernmost region of Croatia, which is dated to the 15th uh, century and has uh, this letter M, which stands for St. Michael. There is a similar letter M also found in the console in the church of St. Martin in Sventi Martina Muri, a village 10 kilometers to the north of Mi from Mihovljan, which is on the border with Slovenia. A similarity of the formation of the letters is obvious. It is assumed that the letter M in St. Martin stands for Martin, and the letter N in Varaždin could stand for Nicholas, the patron of the church and the parish. The first written mention in document of St. Nicholas as the patron of the parish church in Varaždin dates back to the 1455. The seven-pointed star located on the right upper part of the keystone is a very rare display, and so far I have not found that uh, any comparative examples uh, of seven-pointed star on the coat of arms. Uh, it could be represent a symbol of noble people, leadership, or excellence. Uh, now we go to the castle in Varaždin that was owned by Ivanis Korvin at the turn of the 16th century. And uh, this castle of Varaždin gives us the important data concerning the buildings in Varaždin. We know, we, we know very little about the life and work of Ivanish Korvin in Varaždin, but some buildings elements show influences from Hungary and the Korvinus workshop in particular. The Gothic benches, for example, that are placed in the ground floor of the main rectangular tower, that the Gothic profiles at the portal to the so-called guild tower and the remains of the stove tiles, it all showed the skilled master. Uh, we can presume that uh, when he, he was owning this estate, Matthew Corvinus brought one of uh, some Hungarian masters to work for him in Varaždin, at least on temporary basis. These masters could also have uh, uh, carved the stone pieces for the castle, and it's high likely that they also made the stone architectural decorations for the par parish church of St. Nicholas. The parish church was the sacral symbol of the free royal borough, and the citizens of Varaždin was, were very proud to be under protection of the king because they didn't have so many taxes. That's why uh, the Varaždin uh, was also for some time a very uh, important place and was also for some time the capital of Croatia <coughs> in 18th century. So uh, it could be assumed that the king was one of the donors to build and to renovate this, their church. The coat of arms of Varaždin, confirmed by the King Matthias Corvinus, is placed high on the bell tower of the church showing the close relationship between the king and the citizens of Varaždin. Unfortunately, the other symbol of this, that connection, the keystone with the coat of arms, is no longer, longer on, a, on its original place. It was built in the church walls and hidden until recently. Furthermore, based on the analysis of carving styles and details of the preserved Gothic arch ribs embedded in the walls of the crypt, along with the comparison with the ribs of similar shapes and dimensions, as you can see here, uh, Church of St. Mary in Remetinets. The preserved remains of the arch ribs and the keystone could be dated to the second half of the 15th century. As the result of finding the keystone uh, by me, and also concern, cons, uh, connecting it with the uh, royal family Corvinus, as uh, patrons for the construction of the Gothic phase of the Church St. Nicholas in Varaždin in the sec second half it in, of the 15th century. Uh, the new facts about the history and art layers of the church building itself have been discovered and moreover, a firm rela relationship between the city of Varaždin and the royal family Corvinus has been verified. So I hope uh, you understand everything, and thank you for the attention.
we thank Vesna Pasutini Uraga very much for this excellent cultural summary relating to the relationship between uh, the history of Croatia and Hungary, because it has also brought it a little bit closer to our hearts. And uh, I always tend to say that these regions are not far from us, mostly in summer. A lot of Hungarians travel to Croatia, so it would be worth stopping a little, uh, visit Lepoglava, Varaždin County, from where these research uh, originate. We have uh, wonderful memories of the research and of uh, the, these locations. Our next speaker and uh, his paper is going to be a unique uh, paper. Um, Morban and his writings about uh, the Hunyadis are of outstanding importance. I have a very good friend who doesn't read too much, but uh, when the volumes of the Hunyadi series are published, he bought them immediately and uh, went through these books very fast. And I think that uh, this is really uh, a very high appreciation from people who are not adamant readers. So I think that this series, the series on the Hunyadis, uh, which uh, was very difficult to get hold of in certain times, uh, has become very popular in Hungary. It has become the favorite of a lot of young people. Before, they didn't even think of reading a book on the Hunyadis. So I, I think that uh, this is the series um, will remain with us, will stay with us in the long run. It will, it, it is and it will be a very exciting read for young people. And uh, it provides a lot of historical data which are close to reality, which reflect reality and which bring the reader closer to reality. And uh, by doing so, they are also instrumental in a learning process while reading these books, the volumes of these. Uh, and I think that this series fills a gap in Hungary and as such, it is unprecedented in Hungary. And we can also say of this series that uh, if once it will be translated into Croatian or Serbian, these stories will provide very exciting uh, read for people living in the region. And we know that uh, the story of the Hunyadis uh, becomes more and more visual. So now let's listen to the author, his thoughts, his ideas, what is the role of the Hunyadis in literature and in art? So, our next uh, speaker, Mr. Ban. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you. First of all, I would like to thank for the Institute of Hungarian Studies for the invitation. It is a great honor and privilege for me to take the floor besides scientists as a writer. I would like to share a few thoughts of mine with you on the Hunyadi family. Some examples. Uh, about uh, King Matthias and John Hunyadi and their role in Hungarian art uh, uh, in different branches of art, music, um, literature, painting, etc. Perhaps it is quite extraordinary, but at the end of my presentation, I would like to also like to speak about the world of films, uh, cinematography, which we know is has become one of the most important cultural branches 
Uh, many people used to read, but less and less people are prone to become ardent readers. Most people uh, uh, experience or see history through films. Uh, so I would like to speak about the general picture, uh, the general image of the Hunyadis, of the Hunyadi family. Let me start with something that we encounter day by day. Uh, uh, the pic uh, description or depiction of these historical figures in public places. Uh, uh, the, the image of uh, John Hunyadi and Matthias uh, Hunyadi. Uh, uh, whichever sculpture of John Hunyadi we see, we see something uh, uh, that we cherish in our soul and spirit, a soldier protecting uh, Europe. Uh, uh, it is quite disturbing to see, or quite surprising to see, that when we examine or scrutinize the sources, we can see that the image has stayed intact through centuries. It is quite uh, intriguing to see uh, that it is a completely different image from the one of his son, Matthias. Uh, the majority of the sculptures can be found uh, throughout the country. So Uh, the last one was inaugurated in Zimon. Perhaps that's a little bit different. It is less heroic, perhaps, than the previous ones. And here, one of the greatest uh, kings of Hungary, King Matthias, uh, uh, about whom we can say that the image uh, created by the contemporaries and uh, uh, future generations are very different from the image that we hold today. The heroic behavior of the king, his role in European history was evident also for the contemporaries, not only in Hungary, but also abroad. But uh, his reputation uh, is quite varied. Uh, 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 there were certain periods of his reign uh, when he was absolutely not popular. Uh, the collective consciousness of everyone in Hungary thinks uh, or holds uh, that King Matthias was a just uh, and decent uh, and moral king, but uh, there were very many. He had very many enemies. Uh, uh, at the time of his reign, um, there was a strong opposition. Uh, Mihai uh, Silagi, Michael Silagi, his uncle who made him king, uh, uh, rebelled against him because perhaps uh, he was jealous. Uh, uh, Matthias was only 15 years old when he gained power. Uh, John Vites, Janus Vites, um, is something different. Uh, uh, he was the supporter of Matthias, and he took part in his education. But Janusz uh, uh, Vitez also turned against the king at a moment when many, many people stated that this ruler is a tyrant, uh, uh, a dictator who uh, limited the liberties of the country of the time. Uh, so it is quite interesting to see how the public image uh, changed uh, during the centuries. Uh, Bonfini, uh, soon after the death of Matthias, uh, wrote uh, about the changing attitude of the Hungarians vis-a-vis -vis, uh, 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 the son of King Matthias. Uh, John Corwin uh, uh, should have become uh, the heir to the throne or the new ruler. Lots of lots of people promised him to support him, but then they abandoned him. 
uh, during the reign of uh, Ladislaus II, uh, the uh, Turkish, uh, the Ottoman Empire gained ground, and then Bonfini wrote that everyone in Hungary uh, uh, were on the belief uh, or in the opinion that uh, uh, they uh, would have liked King Matthias to return. Uh, they were then already willing to pay taxes. Uh, um, so that uh, Matthias could defend them from the Ottoman enemy. The dark centuries that were to come uh, created an image of Matthias uh, and his ruling as the golden age of Hungary that would never return. Uh, this nostalgic feeling uh, strengthened in all social layers of Hungary and uh, 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 this uh, image was also reinforced uh, by the historians in Italy uh, that King Matthias somehow became a legendary ruler. A whole image, a whole myth was created, emerged. Uh, uh, previous stories uh, were integrated into his biography, uh, stories about Louis. Anjou, everything that was positive was invested on his figure. Um, when we look at the legends and tales about uh, Matthias, we can see uh, incredible anachronistic features. Uh, uh, Matthias, King Matthias, uh, as uh, Lajos Kossuth, hero of the 1848 revolution, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, an idealized picture overarching centuries detached from reality. Once again, this is intriguing and interesting because this image uh, uh, has uh, significantly transformed, uh, had significantly transformed, and then it rooted in the collective subconscious of the Hungarian nation. Uh, let's uh, talk about paintings. Uh, I took some examples which are quite uh, um, informative. Let's look at the master masterpieces of painting. Here you can see uh, the painting of uh, Sandor Wagner, the self-sacrifice of Titus Dugovic. Uh, uh, it uh, commemorates uh, uh, the historic event uh, uh, we celebrated today or to yesterday, uh, the most uh, tragical moment of the siege. Titus Dugovic sacrifices his own life and takes the life of a Turkish soldier as well and uh, saves the castle and uh, makes it possible that John Hunyadi and John Kapustran uh, uh, next day, uh, the following day, could defeat the army of uh, Mehmed II. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, what are so interesting about this painting? Uh, first of all, uh, it illustrates, uh, it depicts a person uh, who was a real person. Of course, he was not uh, called uh, Dugovic Titus, uh, Titus Dugovic, but it is quite obvious that this moment uh, in Hungarian history is a, uh, is, is, is a moment that determines the course of history. Uh, in Hungary, it is, it is it is and it was an example to follow. Uh, some historians question uh, uh, the event itself uh, and are quite uh, critical about uh, uh, the reality or uh, whether this event uh, occurred in reality. But still, this painting somehow captured the very moment. Uh, when uh, the Hungarian hero uh, sacrificed his own life. I think it's a very authentic de uh, depiction because uh, the painter uh, had the opportunity to talk with the veterans. Uh, 
uh, of the siege. So I think this is an authentic uh, 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 depiction of the real events, even though the hero's uh, name was different. Uh, uh, in this picture of Sandor uh, Wagner, depicted a very realistic uh, uh, scene. Uh, the tones and the colors are quite uh, theatrical, uh, but there is one thing which is not authentic, and that's the Hungarian flag. Uh, it is uh, not uh, the contemporary flag, but uh, uh, the red, white, and green flag of Hungary. It was not a mistake. Uh, 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 he painted uh, uh, this anachronic flag twice in the picture, so it was quite conscious, uh, uh, conscious intention of his, so irrespective of time and space, uh, this heroic behavior is the typical characteristic of the Hungarian nation. There were uh, anonymous uh, soldiers and soldiers with names who sacrificed their lives uh, uh, for Hungarian liberty and uh, freedom. And uh, irrespective of the fact where it happened, when it happened, before this glorious victory or later. Bertrand Seke, another Hungarian painter, uh, Ulrich Zille of Zille and uh, Ladislaus V. It is a perhaps less known painting. Uh, this is a, a quite popular uh, uh, period of Hungarian painting. Um, uh, uh, very many paintings are not on uh, Matthias uh, Hunyadi or John Hunyadi, uh, but are related to the death of Laszlo Hunyadi, not by chance, because uh, his death uh, 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 was very tragic, something uh, similar to a Shakespearean uh, tragedy or drama. Uh, uh, 1870 is the date uh, of uh, the painting. Uh, this is after the Austrian-Hungarian compromise uh, when the political atmosphere was quite uh, uh, special. Uh, the execution uh, of Laszlo Hunyadi uh, are also depicted by Jula Benzur and Victor Madras. Uh, uh, these paintings, of course, were much more than the execution of Laszlo Hunyadi, but this is somehow a symbol of the defeated Hungarian War of Independence, the uh, Hungarian War of Independence and the Revolution of 1848. Uh, this is an allegory. This is very typical of uh, the artistic reflection of uh, Hungarian artistic reflection. Uh, they had to use historical symbols to be able to speak about uh, tragic events that uh, should be kept silent about at the time. Music, uh, the field of music. Uh, uh, the first uh, logical or obvious example is uh, Erkel's uh, opera. Laszlo Hunyadi, uh, titled Laszlo Hunyadi. So it is neither connected to uh, it, it was this intermediary figure between Matthias, uh, King Matthias, and John Hunyadi. Uh, uh, it was based on uh, um, the novel of Chile. Uh, it is uh, uh, this opera depicts. Uh, the conflict between the Habsburg ruler and Hungary in 1844 in this very important pre-revolutionary year. Uh, it was uh, 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 a piece of art, an opera, that showed the example. Uh, it is not by chance that before the outbreak of the revolution, uh, they had to change the program of the Opera House. The audience wanted to hear an aria uh, from uh, this uh, opera. Uh, uh, this uh, opera, 
uh, depicted an era when Hungary uh, fought against uh, the Habsburg rulers, the Habsburg house. Uh, it uh, uh, somehow grasped or grabbed a moment uh, when uh, a heroic fight uh, took on against uh, the foreign rulers. Uh, this example uh, 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 is an oratory, Tomás, uh, Gergely Tomás's oratory that was written or composed in 1956, and it was uh, 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 on stage uh, in the United States. Uh, everyone, or most of you, must must know that uh, the events of the 1956 uh, revolution had their preceding events uh, 100 years ago. John Capistran, uh, who uh, participated in the siege, uh, who was a hero uh, 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 and who defeated uh, the troops, the army of uh, Mehmed II died uh, on October the 23rd, 1956, uh, sorry, 1556, uh, uh, 400 years later. It was the exact date when uh, the revolution broke out. So let's turn to the field of literature. Just a few examples. Uh, uh, First, uh, uh, not literary works, uh, but political uh, uh, works uh, or writings of politicians or, or soldiers. Uh, Bonfini's uh, chronicle served as a source for authors for centuries. Uh, I do not think that it is by chance that uh, Miklos Zrinyi in the 17th century or and uh, uh, Boje Zielinski in the 1940s were able to induce uh, feelings in the Hungarian readers uh, that was unprecedented in their oeuvre. Uh, uh, it was not by chance that they uh, as, uh, tried uh, to solve the mystery uh, 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 or the secret behind uh, uh, the Hungarian greatness in the era uh, or under the rule of King Matthias. Uh, uh, we are talking about uh, dark uh, periods of history uh, in Hungary when the authors just uh, somehow depicted uh, certain periods of times, eras, uh, where Hungary was great and where they could uh, get some inspiration. Uh, uh, talking about the Hunyadi family, we should, of course, mention the many, many legends, myths, and tales, uh, folk tales, uh, and ballads. Uh, it is uh, quite interesting to uh, examine the uh, uh, South Slavonic uh, legends, uh, ballads, uh, uh, that were quite uh, different from the Hungarian ones. Uh, there are very many legends uh, in this area about King Matthias. There are, uh, were lots of uh, 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 fights there. Banovic Sekula is a well-known figure also in Hungary. There are fairy tale motifs uh, around uh, the uh, main characters of the ballads. Uh, but when we listen to these uh, or just read these ballads uh, from Serbia uh, or the South Balkan, we can see uh, that they, uh, uh, these figures were very important also for their our na uh, neighbors. They were real uh, heroes of folk literature. Uh, uh, Slovenia, for example, or Slovenian tales uh, uh, depict King Matthias uh, as a mythic uh, uh, ruler, someone similar to King Arthur in uh, Britain uh, novels uh, on King Matthias. Uh, 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 
It is interesting to see that for very long, for a very long time in the classical era of Hungarian literature, um, the 19th and 20th, 19th century, basically, uh, 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 the greatest Hungarian writers chose their topic. Uh, they chose their, uh, their topic uh, some historical historic peri- historical period of uh, uh, in Hungary, but they always voided the era of King Matthias uh, or the figure of King Matthias. They rather chose fixed. Uh, Uh, not real figures, because they wanted to have some liberty in depicting the given or the particular era. Uh, But still, there are many numerous uh, uh, books on King Matthias. Uh, Most of them were written in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, At that time, uh, Um, very few novels were written uh, on uh, the positive or uh, optimistic eras uh, or periods of Hungary. At that time, it was not up to date to write about the glorious uh, periods of Hungary. They rather turned to the sociological problems or uh, the dark ages of Hungarian histories. So we can see that uh, a way of escape, a route of escape uh, for uh, writers kept silent during the years of communism uh, was to write uh, books for children. Uh, and we can be, uh, we can say that we, were, we are very fortunate because great writers uh, wrote uh, uh, very important pieces of uh, art. Uh, Uh, literature to children that remained. Uh, my friend, in his uh, introduction, uh, spoke about my books, my series. Uh, when we planned uh, to publish uh, this series 20, 25 years ago, uh, 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 historic novels were not very popular or not very much supported in Hungary. Uh, 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 historic books only appeared in reprinted versions, uh, and uh, the uh, the uh, outstanding writers of the era uh, usually avoided uh, 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 the choice of uh, uh, this century as their choice of topic. Uh, the editor asked why we wanted uh, to uh, uh, to to publish books. Uh, on King Matthias, uh, and here I would like to, to, to share with you the reply, the response I gave to him. Uh, I do not think that there is any family uh, uh, in Hungary whose uh, three generations had this bright uh, and uh, um, um, fantastic career. Uh, uh, There is no uh, family in Hungary whose three generations had such an impact uh, on future generations. Uh, uh, In the introductory speech, we heard about uh, uh, family generations uh, uh, depicted by uh, Thomas Mann. Uh, uh, but this uh, family was different from the family uh, uh, described by Mann. Uh, uh, this family was able to hold the Ottoman invasion uh, for decades uh, 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 in uh, the times of the Great Peril. Uh, John Hunyadi was an illiterate uh, Uh, instinctive uh, genius, military genius, uh, and his son, uh, during an incredibly short of period of time, reinforces and uh, strengthens the military force of Hungary. When John Hunyadi emerges uh, in the last decades of the rule of Sigismund, uh, 
uh, and we knew that uh, Sigismund was, was not very successful from the point of from the military point of view. He uh, didn't win any battle against the Ottomans. Uh, so this young soldier emerging somehow changed the course of the battles, uh, and. Uh, uh, instead of constant defense and withdrawal, he followed a completely different policy, which was an aggressive uh, 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 approach. And the son of this soldier, this progressive uh, and uh, highly civilized uh, young uh, king, was uh, uh, successful not only in the field of uh, military policy, but also in the in the financial and political field. Uh, and of course, we can understand that such a strong-handed ruler uh, was not so attractive to his uh, uh, rivals. Uh, and the third generation, John Corwin, uh, this Shakespearean tragic figure of Hungarian history, uh, is really very special uh, due to uh, his uh, uh, cir circumstances. He was unable to carry on uh, uh, the route uh, his predecessors took. Uh, uh, the threat of defeat, uh, the golden age, uh, and all the reasons and causes of the final failure is concentrated uh, in the life stories of these uh, three figures all belonging to the same family. So this is the reason why we thought that this series is so important, especially for the young generations, because this is how young people uh, can know about the example shown by our predecessors uh, who did not complain but acted. Uh, and uh, finally, I would like to speak about the most popular um, branch of art, film, uh, cinematography uh, films. The first uh, uh, film uh, was shot in 1911. Uh, uh, this is a 13-minute uh, uh, silent film. Uh, uh, the title was Ulrich Zillai and uh, John Hunyadi. Uh, uh, the opera uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> Martis' uh, uh, work was uh, the basis uh, of the uh, of this film. Lee de Berry uh, was uh, the name of uh, 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 the author of this film. Of course, he was not French, but he used the French name. He was born Hungarian. It is incredible that in 1911, the Serbs shot a film uh, on uh, uh, Laszlo Hunyati and Uri Cillai. Unfortunately, this film wouldn't be popular today in Hungary. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, simply painful to see that uh, uh, Hungarian uh, cinematography is not interested in the Hunyadi era. I think this is simply outrageous that uh, no uh, uh, historic films were made uh, on John or Matthias Hunyadi. Let's say uh, that uh, uh, it it is similar. It, what I can compare it that try to imagine that uh, the Turks wouldn't have dealt with uh, the life of uh, Suleiman the Great uh, or the, fr the French would have dealt with the French Revolution uh, uh, in their films. So instead, uh, uh, let's see uh, uh, what are the valuable films that were still uh, uh, made. Uh, in Hungary, uh, Matthias, uh, The Unfaithful uh, by Karoly Mark, 
Uh, the subtitle is what uh, was your wife doing from 3 to 5 p.m. So I think uh, the title reveals uh, uh, the genre of this film. This is a comedy. Then uh, 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 a television film, uh, uh, the center of the universe, uh, 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 I think it was very popular among the young people. There was a slogan uh, in the film, except for the judge of Yedi, uh, uh, a famous uh, actor played the role of King Matthias, uh, and uh, it influenced uh, uh, the image of King Matthias, or just it f formed the image of Matthias. Uh, uh, and then this is the cartoon, uh, a serious cartoon series, uh, uh, Matthias, uh, uh, tales about uh, King Matthias. Uh, uh, thanks God uh, to this uh, uh, cartoon because lots of people got to know about these events only through this cartoon. Uh, um, uh, let's see. Uh, two other examples, one a Romanian and the other one is an Austrian film. Uh, so let me call your attention, if we do not make films about our heroes, other nations would do that, uh, uh, but perhaps from another angle. The Romanian film uh, 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 is about King Matthias uh, and the title uh, 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 is uh, King Matthias the cruel king? Uh, 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 the Romanians depict King Matthias as a jealous, uh, low-life uh, person, and the, mark, the other one is uh, Maximilian. This is an Austrian film. This is a um, decent uh, series. You can see. Um, uh, uh, a horistically antagonistic and uh, 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 person, King Matthias, who was absolutely not popular in Austria, and that's King Matthias. And finally, uh, uh, a documentary, a scene from a documentary, and that's the future. Uh, I think we have to make up uh, for uh, the lost uh, chances. Perhaps the first steps have already been made. Uh, and uh, a few days ago, it was announced uh, uh, that uh, the Hunyadi novel series, uh, which uh, uh, was published in several hundreds of copies, uh, uh, one of, uh, so they plan uh, to make a, a, a an international uh, television series uh, uh, comprising of 10 parts, uh, and hopefully it uh, will be available not only in Hungary, uh, Rise of the Raven, that's the English uh, working title of this film project. I really do hope that uh, finally uh, the time comes when uh, we can say for whom uh, the bell tolls at noon. Uh, what did Hungary do uh, in order to save the future of Europe? Uh, uh, sometimes you feel that Europe is not grateful, but if they do not know about it, uh, uh, perhaps we should inform them about uh, uh, history, and then uh, with these films, perhaps we will be able to make them understand uh, us Hungarians through the, the, the description of our history. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much once again for this wonderful rendering of uh, the representations of the Hunyadi family in art and literature. May I add that if there is a man, a person behind something,
who is adamant to achieve their objective, then this uh, raven will arise. You just have to continue whatever you started. And I think that uh, John Hunyadi did this. He undertook uh, responsibility, and so did the whole Hunyadi family. And with John uh, Corvin, the family came to a tragic ending, mostly with the children. But there is no other way. Let us continue on our way, and um, let us uh, well, let us be inspired by our heroes. Uh, so it is enough to realistically depict those heroes. And the next speaker is going to be the director of the Research Center for Hungarian Historical Linguistics at the Institute uh, of Hungarian Research. He is going to talk about uh, King Matthias's Italian humanists on the Hungarian language. Uh, please. Welcome, Professor Peter Pomozi. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests who have had the courage and patience to stay with us until now. When we started to talk about the conference first, then I thought, well, if we want to present uh, the genius of King Matthias, then maybe we could spend uh, a little time on the Hungarian language as it was during the times of the king, King Matthias. Because uh, from the house of Arpad to Trianon or to 2021, um, it's a long process, and this period that we are talking about was a peak in this very long period, stretching from the House of Arpads up to now. So I thought that um, Galeotto Martio is uh, a very well-known uh, name to all of you, and uh, Martio was talking about the homogeneity of Hungarian language in terms of dialect and uh, uh, sociolects. Uh, but of course, there were other historiographers uh, that everybody knows, like uh, Antonio Bonfini or Galeotto Martio. So we know these people, we know this uh, histi historiographer whom uh, all Hungarian children learn about at uh, primary school. Maybe they f forget later on, but this is a different issue. So Antonio Bonfini was uh, a court historian, and uh, he came from Italy. And uh, Galeotto Marzio was a similarly very sharp uh, uh, mind. But actually, I would think that I'm talking about Galeotto Marzio on the Hungarian language, because uh, as for Bonfini, I didn't find anything in Bonfini's work that was on the Hungarian language as such. So I will really um, narrow down my focus on Galeotto Marzio. Well, um, you can see that uh, there are different data concerning the concerning the date of birth and date of death of Bonfini, which is 1427 or 1432. Well, actually, both of them worked in the court of King Matthias, but there was just um, a few years, a few years from 1487 to 1490, when uh, these two, Bonfini and Martio, worked together, but they didn't really, they didn't really like each other. Galeotto Marzio uh, appeared uh, in the military camp in 1486 to, to, to be a reader for uh, Queen Beatrix. So he will uh, be start his career as a reader, but then he will be a historiographer from 1488. So 
he absolutely supported uh, Beatrix, Queen Beatrix, um, to follow her husband on the throne. What is what what is this little book? This little book was published um, in Hungary since the end of the 19th. This is um, a very little book, a thin book uh, on the very witty sayings uh, of King Matthias. Uh, and he dedicated this to John Corvin. So actually, as I said, Bonfini and Galeotto Marzio didn't like each other. Let us take Bonfini off our agenda now, because we are too tired now. Let us stick to Galeotto Marzio. Janus Pannonius met uh, Galeotto Marzio in uh, Ferrara. And Janus Pannonius, uh, as well as Archbishop Janos Vites, uh, played a very important role in bringing Galeotto Marzio to Hungary. This painting, just to uh, you know, pick up where the previous speaker left off. So this painting is related to the King Matthias cult between the two world wars. And uh, this cult of the king was also very popular in uh, Italy. After Trianon, after the Trianon uh, peace, uh, treaty. The Hungarian government was uh, rather isolated, and uh, they had a genius uh, cultural diplomacy, which helped them to break out of this uh, isolation. And um, the Hungarian Institute in Rome was uh, established then, which will be the Hungarian Academy in Rome. And actually, the founder and director of this uh, academy can be seen here. You see? <laughs> That's, yes, this, this is Galeotto Marzio, but actually this is Tibor Gerevich, Gerevich and uh, he's related to actually Aladar Gerevich, who is uh, a multiple Olympic uh, gold medal holder. So we have a lot of depictions, credible depictions of uh, Galeotto Marzio, and we have a lot of pictures uh, of uh, Tibor Gerevich, of course, and I, I knew him personally because he established the Roman uh, Academy for Painters as well. So Gerevich Tibor looks very much like Galeotto Martio. So this is a naive uh, and uh, yeah, this is a very naive uh, way of painting this, but this is a, also a, um, attractive uh, painting. So the painting was painted in 1940, as you can see. Let's go on. Galeotto Marzi. Marzio comes from uh, Narni, Umbria. This is an unbelievably wonderful town. Well, this is uh, current day um, Umbria and Narni, but uh, I'm sure that not too much has changed since then. So I, I think that a film could be shot here about the Quattrocento. So you don't even need any anything to be added. If you have been to Perugia, Assisi, um, those know that uh, these are wonderful places. And I think that Narni has everything that is really typical of this uh, beautiful Italian uh, landscape. So as I mentioned, Galeotto Marzio met uh, Janus Pannonius in Ferrara and uh, he started uh, to teach at the University of uh, Padua as of 1450 and later on he also uh, was a teacher or lecturer in Bologna. And uh, well, this is the 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 period when uh, there was a plot against uh, King Matthias and uh, there were people aspiring to the uh, throne from uh, 
Poland, and of course it has some bearings on Galeotto Marzio uh, as a close friend of uh, of uh, Janus, and he had to go. He, he was imprisoned in Venice, but then King Matthias and Lorenzo il Magnifico uh, intervened and uh, also in Venice and in Rome, Matthias, uh, King Matthias and Lorenzo il Magnifico did a lot to get Galeotto Marzio out of the prison. So he enjoyed uh, uh, earthly pleasures and he was absolutely open about it. Uh, Boffini also wrote a book uh, about uh, the chastity of uh, married life, uh, but uh, do not believe half of what he uh, wrote. So Bonfini is uh, not very friendly in this book to Galeotto, Marzio and Beatrix. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Marzio was a supporter of John Corwin, but he was liberal liberal, even in the Quattrocento, which was a period of uh, um, liberalism as well. So he was uh, imprisoned in Venice, as I m mentioned. He was imprisoned for his book. Uh, I will I will show you this, The Incognitis Vulgo. This is uh, the title of the book for which he was imprisoned. This is on uh, ignorance, on vulgar ignorance, so to speak. So uh, it was absolutely outrageous in certain uh, city-states in Italy. But King Matthias uh, liked him so much and respected him so much that uh, he did a lot. He made efforts to get him out of the prison. So as I mentioned, uh, um, he got out of the prison and he went back from Rome to to the court of Matthias. And this is when his second, uh, um, second uh, phase or period started. And he wrote a book on the wise and witty sayings uh, of uh, of Matthias, the egregie sapiente cose dictis ac factis regis matie, that's, that's the name. It was dedicated to the young John Corvin. And uh, this contains the part which gave the idea for the title of my presentation. There is also an Italian uh, translation here, but I would like to read it out in the context, what did Martio write about the Hungarian uh, language? So, actually, what uh, Mr. Pomozi is reading out now is a part of this book in Hungarian about saffron, about eating, and now listen to this part because uh, this is not written here. So, during lunch, they were discussing serious things, or they were making jokes, or they were singing, because there are bards and there are minstrels who are singing about the deeds of the heroes. This was a Roman tradition which was passed on to the Hungarians. They are always singing about some heroic deeds. Well, Hungary is located between friends and enemies. There is always a, a fire of the war. They are singing about uh, heroic deeds against the Turks and not love. And the, because the Hungarians, whether they are noble or peasants, use the words the same way. There is no difference in the way they speak. They use the same expression, they have the same pronunciation, they have the same accent everywhere. Because 
when we talk about Italy, we must say that there is a huge difference between the burghers and peasants, those living in Calabria and those living in Tuscany, that they do not even understand each other or with difficulties. But Hungarians have the same way of speaking. So consequently, the peasant, the burger, and the nobleman understands the Hungarian song. So this is the citation or the quotation. These are the observations of Marzio. So what is he saying? He says that every Hungarian understands every other Hungarian, not like in Italy, which means that uh, in Italy there are several dialects, the users of which do not understand each other or understand each other with difficulties and, um, you know, hence the gestures. Uh, but we have an Italian guest here, so I'm not going to show you the gestures, you know. So I don't want to, to sound and, uh, you know, to be seen uh, a bit, uh, well, awkward. But in Italy, there was a communication gap, and this is why those broad gestures have uh, evolved. Galauto Marzio. Um, concluded that there is no communication gap between the Hungarians because the way of speaking and the, the vocabulary is the same. And he also observed, he also observed that uh, the, the, the same applies to the folklore as well. They are singing different songs. Uh, Basically, these are not love songs, but uh, these are songs about the heroes and the soldiers. And he underlines that uh, the nobleman and the peasant both understand the same language, the same songs. In the whole territory, the same language is uh, spoken. But there is not only a horizontal, but a vertical axis along which people understand each other. So there is not one separate language for the nobleman and another uh, variety of the language for the peasants. Uh, well, if they want to establish uh, a standard like Italian, the vulgar Italian, that can be made uh, more noble with some Latin words. Uh, but it would have been uh, very strange uh, to, to use medieval Latin words in Hungarian, you know. So the language of uh, poetry was um, comprehensible for everybody. Of course, we are not talking about the Latin poems of Janus Pannonius, but we are talking about the poems uh, which are recited in the court of the of the king. We are talking about the songs of the bards, the songs of the minstrels, so the kind of songs that you also heard at the beginning of this conference. Let us also mention that uh, Marcia was a humanist with uh, huge uh, uh, knowledge. It doesn't really matter um, how much he enjoyed the earthly pleasures, uh, um, but what is essential is that he knew everything uh, about his own field of science because he taught literature as well. And uh, he was well read. He knew, of course, he knew Dante and, uh, of course, uh, he knew the different transcripts of Dante's work. Uh, which was absolutely, absolutely a pioneering work. Uh, the Vulgari Loquentia, this is the work that uh, I'm talking about. Uh, well, when we talk about uh, Dante, we are talking about the beginning of the Trecento. In Italy, there are 14 dialects which are very far from one another, but because uh, the language of the people is more important uh, than the author's Latin, it was very important to 
to raise the standard or, or vulgar Italian uh, to be the standard. And this is a very, this is very ancient, and this is more ancient uh, than uh, the standards of the antiquity. Well, of course, uh, I'm sure that Marzio knew Dante's uh, essay on the language because uh, it, it talks about um, dialectical, sociolectical um, aspects. Uh, and, uh, well, of course, Dante is the beginning of the Trecento, and maybe in certain regards uh, he is uh, naive, but uh, that was uh, a long time ago. Here you can see Italian peasants, actually. Um, and I think it comes from the 18th century, but I didn't find anything that uh, would be older than this. So let us see, finally, what is behind Martio's observations or comments. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the Hungarian language in the period of King Matthias is, uh, has, has reached its uh, peak uh, by then. The Geographical Research Institute of the Academy of Science made different uh, maps of the population of uh, Hungary. And uh, it shows uh, how homogeneous uh, is the map. Uh, orange shows uh, uh, territories with uh, Hungarian majority in terms of population. But actually, I do not really like such, such maps uh, because uh, the population is not indicated uh, in line with its percentage in the population. So this is a huge territory, and this is an ethnic and linguistic mosaic uh, with um, population, with bilingual or multilingual population. So. What you can see in this map of Hungary shows uh, the largest ever Hungarian population, the largest ever, not even during the dualism do you have uh, such a large uh, Hungarian-speaking population. Why? How was it possible? It, it's very difficult to answer from a, um, a linguistic point of view. Why? Because we have very uh, scarce data on uh, the dialects, for example. We do not have enough linguistic data to answer this question. However, we can say where in these uh, territories uh, was a population which was bilingual or multilingual. So maybe in the South Slav territory, Slavonia, South, uh, South uh, Slavic parts, and in Upper Hungary, uh, Upper Hungary in terms of uh, after Trianon, you can see that uh, there are broader uh, Slav-speaking uh, uh, populations. Uh, of course, there have always been Slavic-speaking populations uh, here. It's only the rate that has uh, changed. And, uh, of course, the Turkish... Uh, occupation brings about a change from the beginning, from the six, uh, 16th uh, century. What is the lesson uh, to be learned from this? If there is a Hungarian domination that uh, develops in 200 or 300 years, then it is absolutely unavoidable that uh, the, the Hungarian language comes under the influence of various different languages in different parts of the region. So Palots, for example, is a Hungarian dialect. And uh, in that area, there is a very strong link between the uh, Hungarian in Hungary and the Hungarian spoken uh, uh, in Upper Hungary. But um, there was some cultural erudition and if there was some cultural erudition that even um, even even people 
in the south of Transylvania were able to understand people uh, in the north of Hungary, which is really very exciting. And uh, those who have some uh, knowledge of, uh, that, of uh, linguistics can read and understand uh, the oldest uh, Hungarian written literary um, texts. So uh, I think that uh, this is something very, very specific, because uh, if we talk about um, Italy, maybe somebody speaking standard Itali Italian now wouldn't understand the first written uh, Italian texts, uh, but I cannot really give a proper explanation uh, for uh, for this, and I don't want to give uh, some uh, um, esoteric uh, explanation. So what is the reason for the homogeneity of the Hungarian language throughout 1,000 years? Well, that we do not know, but Galeotto Martio did recognize this, and he also recognized that uh, in terms of uh, sociolects, it was a very democratic language because uh, people from the different strata of society understood each other. So I think that um, uh, this was a short uh, presentation dedicated to Galeotto Marzio and uh, his genius uh, observations. And uh, I would like to Thank you very much for uh, staying with us. And if you are interested, uh, if if you are interested, then please look for this book. I think it is still available, and it is uh, a very enjoyable book. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Professor Peter Pomozy for this insight into linguistic uh, secrets and the uh, links to King Matthias. Well, thinking over the first day of the conference, I would like to thank all our speakers for their presentations. I would like to thank our audience here and uh, on the internet for bearing with us. Uh, tomorrow, we continue the conference. We start at 9 o'clock again. If we think over what issues we have been discussing today, then uh, I think I can conclude that we have managed to achieve our objective of uh, examining an area which so far has not received a priority attention, but which is badly needed. So here, biology, natural sciences encounter human sciences. Uh, and uh, now again, this was a proof of the fact that uh, even if we use different instruments, we have different conclusions. But if there is a will in the different representatives of the science, then we are able to understand each other and we are able to think together. So I would like to thank you again for being here, for uh, thinking together over these issues. We continue tomorrow and have a very nice evening and see you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you.